So we are going to get started today collaborating with all of you. As Carl said, you are going to create this afternoon. And your creation is going to be something that we're first going to share here, and then you're going to share with the world. So we're really excited about what's going to happen today. And I'm going to let Julia get us started. Um, just so you know, I've been one kind of writing project trainer or another since um, probably for about 17 of my 21 years in education. I was lucky enough to have a mentor who helped me because even in English language arts, you might be surprised to know we never feel like we get enough uh, instruction in how to instruct others in writing. So that was something that I had to put a little extra time and seek out myself. And that's something that I try to bring to the students that I work with now that are entering the field. But it's a kind of an interesting little phenomenon. If you tell people you're an English teacher, I don't know if this happens to y'all, but you get this face a lot. <laughs> Everyone immediately starts to think you're going to edit their speech. That's the first thing um, that, that happens. Um, and if you ask them about what they enjoyed, you know, you might get a lot of people telling you they love to read, they really appreciated the books that they read, or more often you hear the story of the red pen on the paper. That's what happens to me and just, you know, general out and about in the public when I interact with people and tell them that. So I would say that it's, it's a fair statement that everyone has a feeling about writing. It could be really positive, it could be really negative, but because we all went through this thing called school mm -hmm. where we had to write, we definitely have an opinion about it. So we kind of wanted to give you a couple of minutes just to turn and talk with the folks at your tables. Um, you could be in a pair or maybe in a, a, a quad if you wish, just a couple of minutes. How does writing make you feel? You know, we've put up a few things that you could think about with respect to your daily or maybe um, academic gear writing, maybe your curriculum or lesson plans, but it could be something more personal that, than that. Just turn and talk with someone near you. How do you feel about writing? Is there any type of writing that you actually love? <laughs> hola, hola. Quick question. I'm just going to point to one of these and y'all tell me if you love it. Do you love curriculum writing? Let's see the hands. Cool, there's some people that love it, good. What about lesson plans? Super, I'm glad to see these people that I've worked with that love this. What about an email to a friend? We do it a lot, right? Okay, how about Facebook or Twitter post? We're all on it, maybe not. What about story or a poem? What about journaling? No. Some of you. Is there any other type of writing I've not mentioned that you just really love? Descriptive. Blogging. Blogging, descriptive writing. We're going to do that in a minute. That's going to happen. How about this? People don't think of this as writing, but how about lists? Yeah. Some people love oh. writing That's lists. That's a good one, a list. <laughs> <laughs> Grocery list. <laughs> so there is some writing we love, and there's some writing that we find to be more challenging. Our students sometimes find it to be extremely challenging. And because this may be a little bit difficult to read, um, I'm going to take the obviously obnoxious road of Calvin. Julia's going to be Hobbes. And I'm going to say, wait a minute. No, opposite. Go ahead. I used to hate writing assignments, but now I enjoy them. I realize that the purpose of writing is to inflate weak ideas, <laughs> obscure poor reasoning, and inhibit clarity. With a little practice, writing can be an intimidating and impenetrable fog. Excuse me. Want to see my book report? The dynamics of interpreting and monological imperatives in Dick and Jane, a study in psychic <laughs> transrelational gender modes. Academia, here I come. <laughs> I wish I could tell you that that's not what they think. <laughs> I know, unfortunately. So before we get started, one thing I want y'all to do is make a nameplate because I want to get to know you. We are going to make them together, and I just sort of want to demonstrate to you the value and importance of step-by-step -step instructions. I know you don't do it yet. I know y'all probably think you know how to do this, but I have my technique. Don't jump to conclusions. <laughs> but I really want to step-by-step -step because it's so important whether you're giving writing instructions or any sort of instructions, that you do it in a way that the class stays with you. So just be attentive to how I'm doing this and realize the reason I'm doing what I'm doing is to make sure everybody's on the same page and that we make these perfect nameplates. Are we ready? Yes. Everybody got a piece of paper? Let me see it. Okay, we're going to, everybody got a piece of paper? Let me see it. I'm the one. 
Yeah, okay, good, thanks. You're making some noise. You're saying, let's get going, Rose. Okay, we're gonna fold it in half like, as they say in foldables. Uh, what is it called? Hamburger. Hamburger fold, what do they say in Spanish classes? A taco fold. So it should look like this, like a tent that is going to protect you from bad weather. So show me your tent. Everybody got a tent? Protecting yourself from the bad weather? Don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of it. It won't hurt you. Okay, bring it down. We're going to make another fold. Now, in Spanish class, we call this a, in, in foldables, it's a hot dog. In Spanish class, it's a burrito fold. Now, when you make this one, you're going to notice something. Our tent's turned into a house with one leg going the wrong direction. Show me your house with one leg going the wrong direction. Hold it like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Show it. Turn to your partner. Does your partner have the house with a leg going the wrong direction? Okay. We got to fix that. Can't live in a house with a wall going the wrong way. So let's fold it the opposite way so that it looks good. Now, now we have a house. That's even better than a tent, isn't it? Let me see your house. Everybody got a house? No, that's not a house. That's the next step, which is make your periscope. And then the cool thing about this, when you do it, you can honestly eyeball people. See what I mean? From all the way up here, I can see eyeball to eyeball. It's very cool, actually. Oh my Isn't it cool? <laughs> hey, Susan. OK, now I'm going to pray that you do this correctly, because this is the most challenging part. So get your hands in prayer position with your thumbs underneath. The name should be on the side of each hand. Are we ready? Yep. Pray with emotion. Smash it. Now, this is important because it'll help it stand up. If you don't do this, it really doesn't stand up very well. And now, look, we have a great little name tag. So I'm going to go put this back for Gina if she shows up. Now, I want to see if you have your tag. So Piedad is ready. We have Rumin, Sergio is ready, Teresa, Amelva is ready, Dulce, Migdalia, Monica, Susan, and put it out here so I can see that baby Monica. Two Monicas side by side. OK, and we've got Elizabeth and Brenda and Laura. Claire, I think I said Teresa, Jeanette. And back in the back, we have Jody, and we have Anne, Natalia, and Alex. Now, I want to ask you one question before we go farther. How often on the first day of class have you ever been in a class or in a session like this where the presenter has said your name at the very beginning and looked at you? No. It's not usual, is it? How does it make you feel? I'm nervous. Most most people, you are the first group I've ever had say nervous. Am I that aggressive that you're kind of getting worried? Generally, what people say is it feels good to hear my name. Because actually our names is the most important word in the English language. So as we go into talking about writing, one of the things that really inhibits students from even wanting to write is they're fearful and they're self-protective and they're ashamed of what their writing is. Mm -hmm. So it's so important that in that classroom you have established an atmosphere of belonging so that kids can be at risk and make mistakes and write something that may be stupid but it still has value and it can be worked on and turned into something fabulous. Mm -hmm. That's something that has to be established in your classroom. And one way to do it is make sure that you are calling on all your students. Now I can look and I can say, Claire, tell me this. Anne, let me know. I don't have to say the woman in the orange shirt back there or the coral shirt. Uh, the leopard stripes over there. I don't have to do that. I can call you by name. Okay, next. Kind of getting to that idea of vulnerability. Uh, it connects to this quote up here by Vonnegut. When I write, I feel like <clears throat> an armless, legless man with a crayon in his mouth. Um, most of the kids have this idea that the great pieces of literature that they read are something that individuals literally just sat down and wrote. Um, they don't think about the hard work of it. They don't think about how much time that person spent in revision, which is really where the hard work happens. Um, but Vonnegut's is nice because it kind of gets to that idea of vulnerability that you were just talking about. It's important that you feel like you can take a risk to write in front of someone. Um, because if you're going to write about things that you care about, you're going to actually express your personal ideas and opinions. Um, Joyce's is very apropos for Joyce. Uh, writing in English is the most ingenious torture ever devised for sins committed in previous <laughs> lives. Um, the way he did it, that's probably how it felt. Uh, he was an intense reviser because he was just an intense human being. 
So, what do you all remember about constructivism? Does this word ring a bell with you? Would you turn to the person next to you and tell them what you think constructivism means? Although it says it here. What does it mean to you? I mean, what, what does that thought mean? Does that ring bells? From your theory class, like in, if it were me, it would be 1972. In your own words, Susan, what does that mean? In your own words, it doesn't have to be like this. Um, I would imagine it would be something like I'm taking um, criticism from someone and rearranging it into something, like constructing it, molding it into something that I no, but it's maybe not coming out correctly, so I'm... With the writing process, you're thinking of constructing a better piece of writing, yeah. right? The theory behind it is simply like, how many of you remember when we used to talk about language learning as building blocks? We need the building blocks of language, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that used to be a term we used a lot. And that term kind of has developed in this idea that if you're going to give students any kind of new learning, you best build on something they already know. So the same thing with writing, you're looking at your piece of writing, right? That's where Susan was coming about connecting this to the actual writing process. But as we go through this, keep in mind that when you give your students tasks, if they're not built on something the students already are familiar with and know, and I'm talking in this sense about learning their language skills, they're gonna feel failure. So it's real important to build, okay? But there, we're talking about the, what I say, the, what the, let's say what they're going to talk about in the writing. Well, for example, if you have novice learners yeah. and you tell them to write about the favorite thing they did last week, they can't do it. Okay. They don't have the skills to do it. You're okay. setting them up for failure. Yeah. Instead, you have to say, write a list of the three favorite things you did last week, and then guess what? They can all do it. Okay, yeah, sure. Because they've got their list of verbs that that's they've they're, learned. They're relating it to something that's already happened or that's something they have in their mind. Or let me get it clear. When I say a novice, novices can only spout out learned phrases, they can write lists. Yeah, they're just repetitive. Right, they can't create with language and they haven't really learned how to speak in the past tense. So my point is, if you ask them to create a writing piece and your expectation is that they say, ayer comí, yesterday I ate, they can't do it. So you're setting them up for failure. That's what I'm talking about, the idea of build on what they know. Okay. So if they're novices, the tasks must be at the novice level, mm -hmm. okay. So we are going to jump in and do a little bit of writing here in our classroom today. Um, I think, do we have a handout that we want them to use or can they? They can just use any piece of paper. Just they can write it on the back of their name tag. They can do anything they want. Okay, so any scratch paper that you have. Um, if you have a computer and you prefer to type it, I think that would be fine because we're only gonna give you a few minutes for this. This is a quick write, so just be uh, a handful of minutes. As you walk into the teacher lounge, you hear a group of new teachers discussing the media they viewed over the weekend. And we have a little definition down here of what types of media you might think about. This is not all inclusive, but we're talking about TV or internet shows, channels, blogs, or any other source of news or entertainment that you can think of. Explain the extent to which someone's media choices influence your perception of them and why. Maybe think back to a time you actually walked into the lounge and heard such a discussion. Just jot a few notes, if you would, about the extent to which someone's media choices influence your perception of them and why. I'll give you several and, minutes. And I would like to add one thing. If you don't go to the teacher's lounge, it can be in any environment. In other words, sure. when you hear somebody talking about the fact that they love Dancing with Stars, does that impact your perception of the people. That's what we're wondering. Does media impact how you think about people when they talk about it? Can we okay. discuss first with the Nope, partner? this is called, this is a strategy. This is a pre-writing strategy. And it's not a, a pair share. It's you just thinking and writing. Remember, this is a pre-writing activity. So what we're doing is we're sort of getting your brains all sort of warmed up to talk about this. But the next step in terms of talking about this is that we are going to actually, you're gonna take your paper and pencil and you're gonna, we don't have a grid for you like this, but you're gonna just, on your own, I don't think we have a grid, okay. Do you? Do you have the grid? Yay, okay, good. I didn't see it when I was doing the handouts. Okay, so in that case, we are going to do the following. You've thought about it, you've written about it, you are all going to stand up and you're gonna start doing a partner, not, oh, you don't have to stand up yet. You're gonna do a partner interview. Does everybody have a partner? 
Are you all still in a group of three? Okay, that's fine then. No, I think we're good. I think we're, if you don't mind being in a group of three, we're good. Okay, so looking at this, you're going to think about your inner circle of friends. And you're going to talk to each other. And you're going to say, well, how many of your friends are watching Game of Thrones? It's really popular now. How many people do you know that are watching it? And you are going to put a number there or click it, zero to one, et cetera. What about go? Okay, hola, hola. I want you to think about what we've done to this point, And I want you to remember what is so important in LOAT. If we are not getting our students to think about their real lives, they can disengage. You have thought about your real life as you did your quick write. And quick writes are very powerful tools. I encourage you to use them. Jody. Yeah. Just to, can I ask a quick question? It's a different topic. The quick write doesn't have to be shared out. So that changes the whole discussion, right? Because it's just a personal response. So that they're just clicking into the vocab and whatever we need to be able to discuss the topic. But not shared out, it's private. You're not, you don't have to share. I mean, it, you can make that decision based on what you've given the students to write about. But this one, there's no need to share or it out. if they out. want to. Especially, and what's important to me is we are constructing something here, folks. This is step two. We have another step. And another step. And another step. So as you see this happening... Do not necessarily think you're going to do exactly this, but could you, for example, instead of this, what do you like to eat? And have 10 food choices there. How can I utilize it and make it work for my third grade class versus my sixth grade class? Exactly, exactly. And for what's your theme? What countries have you visited? A list. Um, what size shoe do you wear? It can be anything that you want if you want to collect classroom data. Yes. And the beauty of collecting the classroom data is it's real. And it's meaningful. And that's really the goal, right? Real and meaningful. OK. Ready? Yep. Okay. So we're going to move on to activity three, roaming reporter. So this time, you're going to get to get up and move around a little bit, which is probably good. We've been sitting in our seats a little while. Um, we would like for you to try to ask at least seven people that you did not talk to just now, so not the person that you've been conversing with uh, for activity two. And you're going to use the other chart that you should have provided in the handout. And you're just going to make hash marks. So each time an individual uh, tells you not at all, somewhat, or a lot, you'll put a little hash mark next to each of those appropriate media choices that we've listed. And we just selected four from the previous uh, chart to explore further. If you want to add one that says other, because somebody says whatever, that's fine too. You can add another sure. one. In fact, we'll probably keep going until we tell you to sit down. So if you're super fast, feel free to ask other and questions. And if you end up with everybody says not at all to everything, that's not wrong. Yeah, that's exactly. totally fine. <laughs> like me. Exactly. That's absolutely fair. <laughs> but cable news is on that list, Melva. Yes. Okay, y'all stand up. You've got four minutes. Mingle. Mingle, talk. Let's take a seat. Let's take a seat. Look over your results as you're waiting for people to sit down. I think we have a question. I teach middle schoolers. How on earth do I keep them from discussing the TV shows? I mean, do you just have to keep an eye on them and keep them moving? Well, first of all, listen carefully. This is Spanish class. Middle schoolers don't have the linguistic facility to speak, uh, to discuss these shows. What they can say is, uh, mucho, un poco, nunca. So you're going to put this into your language, and your expectation is going to be the level of instruction. And you have to train them. They can only use Spanish, and, you don't, and you're wandering listening. They can't get into talking about the shows. They have, the idea is that this is a conduit for them to be using their oral Spanish. And at the same time, you've collected data so that they can actually do something with it. So all of you talk to other people, not your partner, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah. OK, now we're going to go to the next step. Oops, sorry. Got it? Got it? OK, do you want me? OK. So, now you are, you each have different data. Mm -hmm. We're going to do a comparative analysis of this data. 
You're going to get in groups of four or three, whatever works best for you. You guys can turn around and work with people behind and in front of you. Four is nice because you're going to get more opinions. But ask each other in your group, number one, so what do teachers, LOAT teachers, what media choice is the most watched and the least watched? Number two, do teachers hold diverse media viewing habits? Number three, do your viewing habits match the majority or the minority? Go, work in groups. Hola. Hola. Finish up and we can turn around. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? What you've learned about each other through this process. Think about what your students will learn about each other, no matter what fills up that grid, what kind of things they can be prompted to talk about and to share. But now we're going to move them a little bit farther, right? You've had these discussions, and now? I want to mention here, and if you really wanted to quickly look at it, you can, but we're not going to go there. But what if you're talking about TV viewing? And you find out what teachers like, and specifically LOAT teachers. And I've heard from two people, two different groups today, where are the international YouTube video? Uh -huh. And some of you put that as your other, because probably in LOAT, that's going to be the number one, right? Mm -hmm. But leaving that aside and thinking about the things most people watch in America, do you all think that what teachers watch is the same as what the general public watches? Think it's the same? I don't know. So if you wish with your students saying the same thing, because there are all kinds of research out there that shows lists of most dominant to least dominant of a variety of themes and subjects, this actually is a link to the most watched TV shows. And you could go there and your kids could look and then they could compare mm -hmm. what they're watching, what you're watching and see if indeed the media habits, the viewing habits of teachers is very similar to the viewing habits of the general public. I think the number one watch show, if I remember from this list, or the one show, not the series or anything like that, just the one show, was the recent royal wedding. Mm -hmm. So that was like number one, the most watched. You're doing this one. Yeah. So um, based on your experience collecting the data, so all the data you've collected just in the last few minutes, do you agree or disagree with this sentence? Most teachers share my media viewing choices. Most teachers share my media viewing choices. What you're going to do um, is you're going to get together. You can be in the same group that you were just working with since you guys have already shared some ideas and you might have already talked a little bit about this. I'd like for you together to write just two or three sentences agreeing or disagreeing with this and it, with a short explanation of why you do or do not. And then we will do a little bit of sharing as a class. You only need to have one product per group. That's something that kids always ask. Do we all have to write it down? You can just have one product per group this time. <laughs> Normally my answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, but get together. Most teachers share my media viewing choices. You agree or disagree and why. And once you get together, who's going to be your scribe? Who's yes. going to actually be the person writing? Pick somebody to actually write for you. Okay, go. You've got about four minutes. Go. Perfect. Excellent. So I'm just going to ask um, someone from each group to share, and we'll just kind of move around the room this way. There are two Monicas over here, so I'm going to call on the Monicas. Monica. In the in the black blouse. I, I mentioned earlier. She said she volunteered. To answer <laughs> oh, yeah. okay. So you're the one, she, Monica. She okay. <laughs> Monica, can you share for your large group that you were working with? I can share, but we didn't um, write. I mean, we didn't write full sentences. <laughs> okay. Can you turn so, it into a full sentence as you speak yeah. it? I can do that. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Um, okay. Yes, we agree that most teachers More share um, our media teachers. viewing choices. Um, our research showed, our, our data gathering showed that most teachers um, view um, news media, news channels, as their most, prefer, not preferred, but how where they spend the most time um, 
watching. We believe that it has to do with a couple of factors principally, time being one. It's easy to get ready in the morning and um, listen to the news. You don't have to pay full attention. And we also believe that it is um, mm -hmm. teachers just are naturally curious and want to be aware about what's going on in the world because it affects us. And we can also use um, things that we learn on the news in class. Lovely. Thank you. Let's snap. We snap in, in the English classroom a lot. <laughs> we can also clap if you'd prefer. Yeah, we'll clap next time. Okay. All right. Monica. Uh -huh. <laughs> Monica dos. I'm going to try to read off of this. Um, let's see. Let's see here. <laughs> okay, most of us teachers, we share the um, our media viewing choices. Um, we disagreed with the statement because in our group we had uh, media... Choices? Oh, and I actually, and I think I'll probably, I'm going to put myself out there. I'm the one who watches The Walking Dead a lot. <laughs> I was probably the only one on everyone else's deal, and I apologize. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I do enjoy the show. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take it. But yes, it is a generational because my students also, they're like, oh, did you watch The Walking Dead? And we're like, not every class, stop talking. So, um, okay, so I was the only one who did The Walking Dead. And then we did find that the majority um, were watching the, the news channels. Am I right on that? Mm -hmm. Okay, we noticed that only that she I was the only one. You only talked about me on this. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> like this. And then we all noticed that everyone had a variety of choices. Okay. So it was a good mix of everybody out of the loan. Right gotcha. When it came to the Walking Dead. Very good. Thank you. All right. Snap or clap, whatever you prefer. I'm a snapper. All right. I'm going to put Laura on the spot next. Could you share for your group? The data data gathered shows that we all share a disinterest in the same program, which was like she said, The Walking Dead. Mm -hmm. uh, no one interviewed was watching The Walking Dead, <laughs> except for the one that we didn't interview, of course. <laughs> uh, most of us shared a common interest in cable news, but there's also diversity in the responses. Some watching soap operas, others watching HGTV channels, and the most viewed item, of course, YouTube, since you can control what you watch, and when you watch it, there's more flexibility. Lovely. Thank you, Laura. And let's pass it on to Natalia. Notice how I'm picking someone who was not the scribe in every group. Sharing the load. So we said um, disagree because we find a lot of diversity amongst teachers. The, thing, the things in common seem to be the news or DIY shows. Mm -hmm. um, HGTV, that was, it was what very popular. Uh, we seem to have more in common with a category of other because of how we consume media. So it was pretty much what she was saying. Um, we, have a little, we had a little bit of different ones. He had sports. He added sports. So it also depended a lot, like if you were a woman, the age group, everything. So we didn't agree completely. OK, very good. Thank you. Don't forget to snap or clap for each person. Let's bring it all the way up to Sergio. Well, I'm the one who I was the scribe. <gasps> you were the scribe. Oh, then pass it back to Teresa. <laughs> Sergio, may I have your notes? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Most teachers, we felt, don't share our media choices except in certain categories, mainly cable news shows and HGTV. The majority do not watch The Walking Dead. I did interview Monica. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> We, we did discuss other things that, that people watch, like PBS, Netflix, binge watching, those kinds of things. Lovely. Lovely. Very good. Thank you. Teresa. Is that if I have quiet and peaceful the English classroom is compared to the low classroom? <laughs> um, this, for me, this would probably next turn into a lesson on how you can use the same data to give different results, because in the English classroom, we often have to talk about interpreting graphs and statistics and things like that too, but I'm going to turn it over to you because we're not going to write arguments right. next. <laughs> we're not, exactly. And the other thing that 
We're going to talk about a few slides down the road is how you can actually get students to, to share that data. And you mentioned talking about graphing. Everything we've done can be also graphed using the Excel documents that you send out to your students, right? So um, how did this writing experience make you feel? How did you feel? What we've done to this point? Yes? Uh, I felt it was very structured because we were moving from the data and so it was, um, it felt less overwhelming. Right. Okay. Yes, Alex? It was, a, it was a good icebreaker mm -hmm. for us to kind of get to talk about uh, something in a structured way and, and that, that, was, that was good. Okay. I want to mention that this is an opportunity to build that atmosphere of belonging in your classroom when you get students to hook up together. Those of you who know that I work with, that I used to work with uh, future teachers here on campus, you teach liberal arts, I would have tiny classes, like three Spanish students in a class. And I would assume they knew each other. And I would ask them, do you know each other? And one would say, oh, I think he was in my blah, blah class. They had never spoken to each other. They'd been in classes together. They had never spoken. You cannot build that ambiance and that camaraderie in a classroom unless you do something similar to what we just did. Now you all sort of know each other and feel comfortable, right? That's super important for our next step. Anybody else want to comment on how this whole process made you feel? Yes? I feel that it was great in the fact that there was no wrong or right answer. Yeah. So everybody was willing to participate and get their feedback and not be like, OK, well, they said it. Um, no, everybody felt confident. Oh, OK, well, we don't have the same data, but we still did our job, and it was right the way we did it. Yes, like, everything it, you did was absolutely correct. Yeah, you included everyone, not just like one group focusing, well, you're the only ones who got it right. So, yeah. No, it's, it's everyone. Everybody had, had something different. And you so. all had the opportunity to talk and give your input and share, and that's the goal. Mm -hmm. And also remember, you're not done writing. This is just our pre-writing to get you going. You're going to be writing this afternoon. But anyway, this is our pre-writing. So the next thing I'd like you to do, and I want you to, first of all, I want you to go to this Padlet. And you're going to tell me what you categorize. I'm going to remove this screen after you get on, because I'm going to go to Padlet on this computer. But go ahead and what kind of things in your life do you categorize? For example, I categorize food. Some food's healthy. Some food's not healthy. Some food's low-cal, some food's high-cal. Some is fried, some's baked or broiled. I definitely am a food categorizer. There are foods I'll eat. There are foods I will not eat. There are foods my husband, it will make him sick if he eats. So what about y'all? What do you categorize in your life? And it can be more than one thing. Think of as many things as you can that you actually categorize. Look at all these different things that we categorize, which means they're all different things that you can have themes about for activities in your classroom, many, many, many of them. Okay. So which ones look familiar? Which one comes up most often? Can you tell it just by eyeballing? Clothing. 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 <laughs> food, for sure. We talked about food. Oh. <laughs> These two, right? We're always having to categorize those, right? You put those parent ones that have a big exclamation mark on them. Yeah. They're a special category. Anything else you see up here that people categorize a lot? Groceries. Groceries when they do their food lists. Household tasks. Household tasks. There are many, many, many things that we categorize. And each of these individual things could actually be something you could bring into the classroom and work with. So. I'm going to move forward. If you want to take a picture, or if you want to go back to this Padlet in the future, you can. You've got the address for it. So let me pull up our back to where we were. Command, shift, three. Oh. Command, shift, three. No, no, don't go. Command, shift, three. So put it back. Now, we're just going to take, I think you oh, I was just about to explain. Remember we talked about the fact that we were doing the five E's lesson plan? You may not have noticed, but I'm going to do a quick back here really quickly, and I want to show you on some of these slides. Okay, so we started out, and we had an engagement. 
to make you, we actually we had several engagements, y'all. We had this when you walked in. Yeah. This is similar to what um, Madeline Hunter called her anticipatory set. You saw something up there and you anticipated, number one, I'm in the right place, this is a workshop about writing, yeah. and it made you think a little bit, right? Yeah. So this was an engagement. We had this, we had talking about the writers, mm -hmm. and then we started to explore. Exploring means to put your students in a discovery mode. The quick write was discovery because you were discovering your own thoughts in the process of that quick write. Probably nobody's ever asked you to categorize and think about that sort of thing before. But here, thinking about media, all of a sudden you were thinking about a new topic. And in your brain, you were exploring it. What have I heard in the past? Where have I been where I heard it? How do I feel about all this? How did it make me feel? So exploration continued. All these slides, the partner activity. You were exploring other people's ideas and making discoveries. Here, you are making more discoveries in a more universal way about how others felt. And now we begin to take all that exploration, and now we're going to elaborate and do something with it. So here we started elaborating with our data reporting, where you got together and really looked at, in a sense, it's a continued of the continual exploration, but now you're making concrete discoveries. So we're elaborating in everything we've done up until this point. Then we get to this in the 5e lesson plan, they talk about evaluate. Now mind you, evaluation's ongoing. As you were doing all those previous activities, we're walking around watching. Where are they? How long is it taking them? Should we stop now? Are they being successful? Did everybody get on Padlet? What's going on? So you as an educator are consistently evaluating. But in this act series of activities, we also have a, I don't want to call it a formal evaluation, it's informal, but nonetheless, a formative evaluation, let's do the group right. Now we, as the people who are trying to get information and see what our students have learned through your group right, had the opportunity to hear what you learned without having to go through the whole process ourselves. We get it from our students. Our students explored and our students elaborated on that exploration and they explain it next. When you guys read that to us, you're actually explaining, you're explaining exactly what it is you've learned. So let me go back to this one so we'll be in the right place exactly. Okay. So now the part of this explain is, well, tell me why. Now I could go back to the TV shows and ask, so why do you think every teachers like the news best? You very, um, I think Monica and a couple of you said how important it was you get up in the morning and watch the news. News is important to teachers. It informs what we do in the classroom. So you had a lot of explanation of why as well. So these things can be a little bit fluid. It's not like concrete, boom, done with that, boom, done with that. They're fluid and they flow into each other. So now we really want you to think a little bit more about any kind of categorization. Why do you categorize? Turn to your partner and tell them why it is we even categorize at all. Why do you do it? Let's have a shout out. Y'all just tell me. Raise your hand and say it. Why do we categorize things? Yes. I feel that at the end I feel like I can actually see something. I feel an accomplishment. And I feel like I'm actually in control. Oh, isn't it great to be in control? Yes, being in uh, Amen, sister. I'm all about that being in control stuff. Anybody else? Why do we categorize? Organization. Pardon? Organization. To stay organized? To be organized. To be organized, yes? To use time wisely. Ah, to better use your time. Yes? You categorize. So if you have any buckets, then you can look at your bucket and you categorize. And it's... Oh, you can pri categorize. Oh, I love that. It, that categorization helps us prioritize. Thank you, Anne. Anybody else? Those are all super good answers. They're all super good answers. Julia is going to. Well, I was going to say because the brain loves patterns, we are, you know, just inclined to want to categorize. It does ultimately make us more efficient. Um, if you think of us in the wild, that probably saved our lives. But now it's usually about saving time <laughs> more than our lives specifically. <laughs> 
But with that in mind, I, w I would ask, it's not coming up. Oh. Ever since you did your thing, oh, this isn't got, doing its thing. I have to move that uh, over That's this cool. One. We'll figure it out. Well, I got it. Um, <laughs> does our tendency to categorize ever prove detrimental, though? Yes. <laughs> How so? Yes, when Jody. You when you categorize people. Um, and I would say that that's something that we probably do even if we feel like we're very open people and we strive not to do that. Just as an example, I have lots of friends who give me movie recommendations, but there are people whose recommendations I, I, don't even, I couldn't even tell you what they say anymore because I watched enough movies to know their tastes and my tastes are not the same. Now, does that mean that I might be missing out on a really great movie? It's entirely possible because I have gotten to the point where I just don't absorb it. And these are some of my best friends. So I'm not trying to say I would discount them in other ways, but I can tell you when Dave tells me a movie is like the best movie in the world, I'm, I'm just like, great, Dave, cool. Um, but I don't go watch it. Yeah, to be... You become biased in your choices. Exactly, right? And that's a very natural thing that happens to all of us. And we have to consciously make an effort not to do that because that is how our brains really do work. Mm -hmm. So do we categorize friends and colleagues based on something as trivial as their media choices going all the way back to what we started with this morning? What do you think? Sometimes. 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 Maybe, maybe subconsciously. Not maybe so subconsciously. Much, you know, thinking, but uh, I, think, I think we do at times. I mean, to be honest, I think we do. Mm -hmm. I know um, in the teacher's lounge, I definitely observed sometimes uh, the teachers that I worked with thinking certain things about the young student teachers or the first year teachers when they would talk about shows that, you know, the older teachers were not watching or maybe thought weren't necessarily valuable. Um, certainly when it's English teachers, uh, sometimes the, there's the extra pressure of how good is the writing? Um, and if you're watching you know, the real housewives of it, I think it was New Jersey at the time. A lot of folks were not really thinking much of that show, and some of the young uh, kids were really loving it because it was so melodramatic. Um, I didn't watch it, but from hearing about it, it sounded pretty crazy. Yes. Um, but I actually witnessed sometimes it sort of like pushed them further apart at the lunch table um, because... The young kids would come in and they'd have their topic and the older teacher would come in and have theirs. And as the department chair, that kind of bummed me out because I really wanted them sharing their ideas. Um, so that's part of where this particular topic came from. It was a thing that we actually have seen happen before. Rosie, I think you have a video for us. I think so. Let's push it forward and see if we can. Oh, it came up. See if all my hard work to try to get these things to connect work. love the way she used the jelly beans to kind of keep it in mind. So when she talks about the color of the jelly bean, what she's talking about? Race. Race. When she talks about the flavor? Ethnicity. And when she talks about the bag that it comes in? Nationality. So something to keep in mind. Now, what we've all been waiting for. Well, what Melva's been waiting for. How do we take what we just did as educators, what might that look like in a classroom? It is tough. Let's, well, we're gonna take a look at it, okay? Well, what we were thinking about, um, we feel like stereotypes is probably a thing that a lot of people have units on, mm -hmm. um, both in English, I'm stepping away from that because it yeah. gets loud when I stand there. I think it was us um, too close together. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> We talk about that in English. I believe you guys talk about that probably in Lote. Um, and I think it's a good idea to maybe start with something that's a little bit easier to access as far as what are ways in which we discriminate, which is really what we've been doing up to this point. Um, before you jump straight into the, are you guilty of any sort of discrimination against people but on the basis of their race, ethnicity, or nationality, you really want them to feel comfortable just talking about the fact that this is a thing that a human brain does before we talk together about something a little bit more difficult. Is somebody, yes. I don't know, whenever I, I think of your question, I think of putting something into themes that the students can relate to. Mm -hmm. um, and so something that has been ongoing this summer is the World Cup. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
and many, many team members from, or like many athletes from the World Cup are from different nationalities. They have different exactly. races, ethnicities. And so. And there were a I lot think, of great articles about that. Yeah. And so when I think about how to start off this conversation, I think of something that that's global, um, popular, something that they can relate to that's relevant. <laughs> um, and I think of storytelling um, because I think for anyone, that's right. how we connect mm -hmm. and and then maybe students feel more comfortable sharing their own stories sure that's good that's a good point so if we were doing this with kids um, the next step we might be taking and this would probably be a different lesson day because obviously we already had a lot of things uh, to do but if we were doing this with kiddos in our classrooms today we might be using this quick write prompt instead in our school today do students self-segregate in other words, do they choose to group with others of similar interests and abilities? Why or why not? Um, I feel like this is a pretty accessible topic for any student in any school because this is usually an issue on virtually every school campus. Um, and there are really good reasons why people self-segregate and then there are really problematic reasons why people self-segregate and hopefully those get explored. I want to just make sure that we recognize that we are not saying that these are the questions you would ask a novice. The, you're going to level this according to your level. However, you can ask novice, pasas tiempo, do you spend time with your best friends or with different people? I mean, you can yeah. cr create the sentences to make it comprehensible because the most important thing about these prompts is that they be comprehensible at the student's level. Okay, so we're gonna run through a, a sample mini unit with you but we want to make sure you understand that it's not novice, intermediate, advanced, AP. It's just a global look at topics and the way you can approach the material. How you interpret that at the level you teach is going to di di vary with each of you, depending on what levels you're teaching. Yes, ma'am. Could you translate that novice level sentence? Yes, I will. Yes, I will. So, ACTFL, our proficiency guideline folks that kind of tell us what proficiency levels are says that your novice is a person who in their communication really doesn't create with language. They simply utter memorized phrases. Maybe they can make a list of things. Novices are just like, mm-hmm, mm-mm, and then a few words. Intermediate students, these, uh, the novice is sometimes called a parrot. Just whatever you've taught them, they can parrot back to you. The intermediate student is called the survivor. So this student mm -hmm. can function. You drop them in a foreign country and they can get have enough language. They're able to create with language and get by. And your advanced student is your storyteller because they can use past tense, present, future to storytell. So that's in a very nutshell. That's the basic of those three differences. Yeah, no, I understood that. I was just wondering how did you, how did you adjust that? Oh, I'm sorry. I did it too quickly. Okay. I would, instead of saying this, thank you for asking that. Instead of saying this, I would say something like, do you spend time with your best friend or many different people? That's a very simple present tense statement. Okay, so um, if you, you wanted to go into an advanced level, you could say, you're about to go to university. Will you look for different people to be with or do you think you'll be hanging out with your best friend that goes to school with you? I mean, there are different things you can do to try to evoke the different tenses as well. Subjunctive, indicative, all of it. That's up to you, but you can take this kind of a prompt and you can create the level that you want, the level of communication. Okay. Okay. Um, I think it's not working again. Oh, I just put it in here. It ought to work. I'll do it for you from here. Maybe I'm too far away. Um, so the next thing we might do is present them with a chart very much like what you guys had earlier, a partner interview activity where we had some stereotypical clicks. Now, we put in some clicks that made sense to us from when we were teaching in the, in the high schools and also all the way from back when I was in high school. But here I'm going to suggest, and I'm gonna piggyback on something Natalia and I were talking about earlier. What you might do is if you wanted to use clicks that the students referred to, you could give them the opportunity after that quick write to share with just a neighbor 
you know, don't maybe put them on the spot and have them share with a large group of kiddos. If they wrote something personal, they can share with one person that they're comfortable with. You can go around the room, take some notes of the types of clicks or groups that you're hearing, and then give them an empty chart and you fill it in with some of the things that you hear them saying. This would help maybe avoid, you know, you coming up with a whole bunch of things that they're not relating to. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and make sure that every single class is getting to have terminology that makes sense to them in that room. Um, even if it's, uh, you know, a group that maybe one kid names in the back, but the kid up front doesn't know it, probably during Roaming Reporter, they'll figure out how, what that definition is from the individual who gave it. And another possibility, you saw how Padlet worked, right? You could have initially, even before a, a quick write, you could say, Padlet up, how many clicks are in this school? Can you name them all? And then they will name them. Now, the problem, of course, being they're going to want to say, how do you say kickers in Arabic? You know? So that, do your prep work yourself, because if you do want to help them out with that, you might either have some of those words already ready for them or spend the time because I don't have any problem with them exploring this. If they want to say something and I didn't know how to say it, I always let them explore, go to word reference or go to some other source and find out how do you say it? Is it possible to say it? Some of the words aren't, right? So anyway, take it away. Okay. This should work. It's not. I'm too far away. That's the problem. There you All go. right. So the third activity, which we did earlier, roaming reporter, um, just like you did before, you're going to send them out to talk to whatever number of people you think is appropriate for the amount of time that you have. We threw 11 up here. Um, that might take a long time for your middle school kiddos to get all the way around, uh, but you probably have some sort of system like, I'm going to play the song. When the song's finished, you need to have talked to six people and then be back, back in your seat. You know, whatever your normal system is, employ it for something like this. May I add something? Go ahead. We're also showing you this stuff on a slide. We can't, it takes too much space to put a lot more. You can put, you can put what you want. If you want them to spend a lot of time, you can add some extra ones. If you want it short and sweet. Yeah, exactly. You're in control of that part. They're in control of the data that results. Right. Um, whole class data analysis, we're suggesting maybe at this point you have them give you some of the data that they found. Uh, that way maybe a kiddo who didn't quite get to have as many conversations as you had hoped they would could borrow some of the data as it's being reported out. Um, that will help a little bit with maybe the students who move at a slightly slower pace than the other kiddos who would be able to get through 11 folks in the time of one song. And essentially here, you're just trying to um, ensure that you have something to work with as a whole class to move on to this step. And Rose, you were going to talk to them a little bit I'm going about to just this. say basically, pretty soon we're going to break for lunch. I know some of you know how to build a real-time data chart in Excel, and some of you do not. So when we break for lunch, which is going to be right out there, for anybody that wants to watch me walk through how you can put Excel up, take your student results, and they will watch a chart build right in the classroom, I will demonstrate that right after everybody goes to lunch. Those of you who want to stay can stay. If you know how to do it, you can you go know, get started on it. You know how your administration loves it when the liberal arts people use some STEM teaks in their room, so this would be a way for you to get the math connection if you're getting pressure to do so. Um, I actually love math and I love graphs, but I always thought it was kind of funny that they put a lot of pressure on us to do that. Um, so data reporting. Um, here you're, again, assessing for proficiency. With which clicks did we most closely identify? We've just thrown up some suggested numbers. This is really going to vary class by class and and to some extent on your campus, although I feel like, you know, there's 25, you know, groups that we all seem to have in our schools, the names change or whatever. Um, the novice, you might be asking for just a one to two word response here. Um, for example, you want to take that part? Yeah, I'm just going to say, if you'll notice these differences, everything can be level. So here they've got their chart and they can say, you know, geeks, geeks too. Right? That's all they said. Those two people, two students, whatever. When you get up to intermediate, and I've got this in past tense, but it could be present. Most teachers say that when they were young, jocks. They don't even have to have the verb in there. Do you see what I'm saying? So they'll, they're going to be communicating at whatever level they might be communicating. So this is really intermediate high, to be honest, this sentence. Okay, go ahead. So they'll be talking about students, of course, not Exactly. Teachers. 
We were just thinking about y'all. Actually, when we did this, we were thinking how fun it would be to find out how did you self-identify when you were in high school. But then we thought it was too time-consuming. We couldn't. <laughs> we were language nerds, right? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so just um, similar to what you did before, we've given them uh, an assertion, and they will agree or disagree with it. Uh, high school students most identify with. And since you've done a whole class data, you would actually put something in there that reflected what the whole class data came up with. But the students, you could give them an opportunity to write this independently, or you could do a group write, like we did. Um, in the English classroom, this would probably turn into a moment for like a short response or even an essay. And if we did it in ours, for sure, we'd be asking them to support their conclusion. But I think uh, your students could do this as well according to the level that they're at with the data that they've gathered. And by the way, all that data reporting, there are math takes for that too. So if you need to show those. <laughs> all right, I think we're so, here. Lunch before you leave. So you've got your name plan. So I want to say two things before we actually dismiss you for lunch. I want to remind you that I'm going to stay in here and I'm going to go right to Excel and show you how to build that data in real time. But what we'd like you to do right now is to take your nameplate, and I want you to think about what we've been talking about. Other than stereotypes, can you think of a theme that you might for sure be teaching this fall or next spring? And if you were to create a quick write for that theme, what might it be? So you may pick up your, sorry, Katie, I still have your nameplate. You might pick up your nameplate and say, um, families, and my prompt might be something about families, even something simple. Um, describe the people in your family. It doesn't have to be something real profound. If, okay? if you had novices, you could put a word bank up and say, um, describe your family with as many of these adjectives as possible. So theirs would be a list, um, but at least it'd be a way for them to respond. Sorry for stealing that. OK, so y'all write that down. I'm going to give you a second. Oh, I forgot we put the prompt up there. Yeah, we, <laughs> we gave you a sample prompt. Yeah. So, and this can be a lesson theme that you already use. If you already have a prompt for it, feel free to use what you've already created. You don't have to. No do pressure to create new. something new. Right now, just a theme or a quick write prompt. Too? If you have well, them both, I would write them both. Yeah, you write your theme and your quick write prompt. You'll have two items on your nameplate. On your nameplate, you will have the theme, and you will write one little prompt that you would give your students to get them thinking about that theme. Before you get up and dismiss yourself to lunch, which you can do momentarily, if you would turn and tell someone at your table, it doesn't have to be the person right next to you, but someone at your table, one of the activities that we've done today so far that you're excited to use in your classroom. Doesn't have to be the way we did it, but something that has happened in this room that you would like to try to do with your students this year. Anyway, we're going to start moving forward and pretty, pretty soon the task will fall upon your shoulders because what you're actually going to do for us today is you're going to be thinking about these different themes, these writing prompts, and how you can create in your own classroom a little mini unit based on the concepts that we're talking about today. So I want to tell you that there is a website on the UT website, and I think this is on the Coral as well, and you can correct me, Sarah, if I'm wrong. Um, one of my students last year actually, well, not one of them, four of them, won uh, scholarships to go to Actful based on their absolutely wonderful lesson plans. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so there, UT has an entity called Hemispheres. And on the Hemispheres website, and I also think on the Coral, Sarah, we have the lesson plans, don't we? Perhaps I should take them there instead. So if you go to Hemispheres and you see the things they have to support teachers, they also have this section called International Studies Pre-Service Educator Lesson Plans. And here you will find several really wonderful 5E's lessons created by UT students, you teach liberal arts students. We're going to be, one of the ones that we used as our inspiration today, when we thought about these lessons, was we used one that was created by a young woman who's teaching in AISD now, his name is Katie Cooper. 
and she did one that was basically talking about stereotypes. All of these lesson plans are lesson plans that you can incorporate. You can take them. They're yours. They're for you to have them. And all of them deal with different subjects. There's one called Egyptian Cafe about cafe life that you could have Spanish, French, air, all kinds of cafes. The Refrigerator, Making Healthy and Unhealthy Food Choices. Exploring Music and Loat. Um, weather Around the World. Características y descripciones means sort of stereotypes, characteristics and descriptions of people, which was their real title of it. I think that they didn't want to put stereotypes on the website. But anyway, um, so keep in mind that what we're building on today, the inspiration came from a pre-service teacher who are all remarkable. Where does she teach? She's at Bowie right now. Okay. Yeah. Did you know that? No. Okay. Anyway, so we're going to move along today back to what we're talking about and what you're going to be doing today. Sorry. We're here. Okay. So one thing we're going to keep in mind You've seen us go through the five E's together. On your tables, I've given you two documents that can support you in your understanding of what five E's are about. We're not going to require that you use any aspect of this in what you do today, but I, I'm a fanatic about this lesson plan design, and I want to tell you why. When I started at You Teach Liberal Arts in 2011, I was given a 101 class. They're little babies. They went out into elementary school and they taught three lessons. And I assessed the lessons. And I had students that were in high school and working with high school teachers. They were a whole other thing. I was focusing on these students who were desperately trying to write engaging lesson plans because the little ones have to be highly engaged, right? Mm -hmm. You got to keep them moving. So I would get lesson plans and some of them were good. And I, once in a while there was an amazing one. And a lot of time they were just, uh, they needed a lot of work. So I went into my files that my predecessor had left me, Mary Deal, and she'd put something in there that Round Rock ISD was working on, which was a 5E's lesson plan. And I started looking at it, and I thought I loved the fact that it was so student-centered and that it evoked exploration and discovery by kids and the fact that it put it on the shoulders of the kids to explain back to the teacher what exactly they had learned before the teacher went the next step. So I really liked this, and I thought, I'm going to simplify this template, and I'm going to give it to my 101s. And I think, Katie, you were one of those 101s. Anyway, so in fact, you did the raincoat, where you came, went to school in a raincoat, all wet and drippy, and OK, talking about weather with our kids. I remember that now, your lesson plan. When I started using this different template, and the only change in it really was that explore and discover concept and the, getting the kids to explain, those three. I could not believe the difference in the quality of what my students produced for me. I, I just sat back amazed. So I said, I'm going to bring this up to 640, and I'm going to give it to my students that are working in high schools. And from that point on, I only gave them that template. And I had amazing success. They went, they just turned much more student-centered lesson plans in. So I want you to take a quick look at what I've given you because it outlines, may I look at yours as this model? First of all, I've given you this overview. This document takes each of the E's. It tells, gives you a description of what that E actually means. For example, engage. Introductory lesson should stimulate curiosity and activate prior knowledge. Then it tells you what the link to cognition is and some guiding questions. If you want to engage students, how will you capture their interest? What kind of questions? Should students ask themselves, how should that engagement make them evoke questions about what it is they're going to be looking at? As you go through each of these, those steps are explained for you. And I'm not going to review it with it you now, but I encourage you to look at it after you leave today. This is my favorite one. This on the front says, in this model, what does a teacher do that is consistent and inconsistent? And on the back, what is the student doing that is consistent and inconsistent? And if you look at it, for example, under explain, look at explain. 
What is the teacher doing? Encourages students to explain concepts. Asks for evidence. May formally provide a definition, etc. Uses students' previous experience as a basis for furthering and completing those explanations. And assesses students' understanding. Look at explain what students do. Student explains possible solutions. It goes from instead of teacher telling, 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 to students exploring, discovering, explaining. So I love this document and it really walks you through what it would look like in the classroom if you were to design a lesson and include these elements. And again, remember these are fluid. You wouldn't have to do all of them in one classroom, although you can. You can look at these model lessons to see how that's done. I actually added a, a fifth E that's not on this piece of paper. My kids got confused with the evaluate. They didn't really understand, and they would forget to close. So I added for my students a, fit, a sixth E that was called the exit strategy. And I encourage you to add that on your piece of paper because it's important, very important to close the lesson. So just wanted to kind of review that real quickly with you about the five E's. And uh, remembering that when we create something for our students in LOAT, we want to make sure that we take into consideration the modes of presentation, the interpersonal, interpretive, and presentational mode, as well as how do we connect with other disciplines? And are there any other TEKS that we can include in our lesson plans? And of course, the five C's. So with all that in mind, we're going to move forward. And by the way, you can get that lesson plan on hemispheres. Okay. So one thing that we wanted to make sure to tell you, because a lot of times people get really good at using the five E's, but in language classes um, and, and English language classes as well, when it comes to teaching writing, sometimes they transition back into a more traditional mode. Um, and especially where grammar is concerned. But all the research shows that teaching grammar in an explicit way, while that might have, you, a lot of teachers feel like, well, that worked for me. But it probably really didn't work for them. They just have a proclivity to language. So they were absorbing things outside of that explicit, outside of that explicit instruction because all the research shows that it has very little effect on accuracy. You've probably seen that in your own classrooms. I know in English classrooms, a lot of times um, teachers will think if they're, I'm just gonna use EOC scores as an example. If their EOC scores go up in the uh, revising and editing multiple choice questions, they get frustrated because they say those kids are not using those skills when they actually write papers. That's the best way for them to see in practice that that does not work to actually improve individuals' written or spoken communication. And, um, I, and I would like to really be specific here about this as well, this first one especially, because I know schools, I was there when it happened, when they started telling us all your, semester, your final exams need to be basically Scantron. Mm -hmm. But the problem is it's not how I was really assessing my students. So I got into this thing, you know, about the Scantron testing because explicit grammar instruction is great for Scantron, fill in the blank, identify the wrong thing, match this and that. But that is, if that's how we're preparing students, they're not going to be very successful when it comes to truly communicating orally or in written mode. So starting off with those little bits where it says students combining increases the student's ability to create complex sentences, that's when we move from our novices, they're gathering those tools, right? And then little by little, they start combining. So part of the writing process in LOAT means, and I think, um, Laura, you, were, you said it, or perhaps it was you, Alex, that talked about having the little steps made the writing so much easier. Okay, so that's kind of what we're doing today. We want you to give you the little steps. We want you to give your students the little steps because then they're not going to rebel against that writing, having to produce a, something. Yes, Katie? Um, are there any sample lessons available on Corel? Are there any sample lessons on Corel um, or hemispheres that are specific to like the 5e lesson plan and grammar and like teaching grammar in context? There are, the, the lessons that you have are 5E's lesson plans. They show 
student-centered learning in each of them, and they're all different lessons, they incorporate the learning of grammar in real-life application. Right. You know, um, doing um, a, a grammar through comprehensible input is a whole nother workshop that we're not doing right now, but you can, it can be done. You have to remember the comprehensible part, and you don't want it to all be about, you want it to be more about what y'all were doing earlier, about partner interview, getting around talking to people, sharing ideas, and giving them the, enough of a template to make it work. And I think that, in, I'm gonna try to, in a nutshell, I do a workshop about comprehensible input and grammar, and I show them how, if you wanna teach kids indirect object pronouns, mm -hmm. and let's say they've learned a bunch of food. So instead of just saying an indirect object pronoun, is blah, 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 or direct object pronoun, I think this was for direct object actually. But then I wrote, I put a slide that said, lo comes? Oh no, lo comes. Do you eat it or don't you eat it? And then I put a picture of asparagus or whatever. It had The gender had to match, right? Um, I can't think off the top of my head, but anyway, I would have a, a vegetable and then it would say, and then it was there, lo comes or no lo comes? Si lo como, no lo como. And they would pick, it would be there for them. They didn't have to think, si lo como, no lo como. It was there for them. Yes, I eat it. No, I don't. It was there. So they saw the gender. And after you do four or five slides, what about... Um, Las something with a feminine plural. Las comes o no las comes. And then they'd see the fruit or vegetable that was gender female plural. And then they would, they would see the answers. Las como, no las como. They're not having to invent that. They're just having to select. And they're working with a partner. And kind of they're laughing because I remember I put rabbit up there. Because people do eat rabbit, right? But they're like, ah, no lo como, I don't eat it. No, no, because they all freak out they're eating thumper. Anyway, the point being, you kind of, you could do a whole bunch like that. And when they finish up, guess what? They figured out that that vegetable is what low is or loss, and you don't have to tell them. Mm -hmm. And that's how it works with grammar. Mm -hmm. And the same thing about base, uh, the a personal. Besas a Juan? Do you kiss him? Besas la mano? Besas la mejilla? You know, you go through a whole lot of examples, and all of a sudden they go, hey, there's always an A with a person, and you don't have to give them the grammar rule. But they practiced a bunch. Right? Okay, enough. Uh, explore to uncover learning, and that's what they do with what I just described to you. Okay. okay so this is you. I'm talking a little bit about motivation um, to write. And I mean, obviously, that you probably already have some of your own tricks, and we all know that choice helps with this. But generally speaking, not focusing on form first is a real big way to get people to feel comfortable jumping in. Um, form really follows content. And I feel like I know in English, the biggest uh, pitfall that kids have is they're writing something they don't care about because they're focusing more on form either because they've been asked to do so or because they've been taught to do so in previous classes. So you really have to kind of broaden their understanding of your ability to accept, you know, the content in various forms. And then when you want them to shape it into something, you get explicit at that point. Um, but you have to really convince them that you feel that way because they want to get it right. Um, even the older ones still want to get it right. Um, writing in one's own voice, um, that's, you know, when they're novices, I think that's going to be pretty easy because they're going to be using little tidbits. Um, so you might not really see their voice emerge until maybe a little bit later, maybe intermediate. But the stipulation is putting it to them to really just express their own thoughts in the way that they would say it. And that's comfortable for you. May I step in there about the whole novice thing? For sure. So she's right that they're using tidbits. But even a novice can say, me gusta, no, I like it. No, I don't like it. I love it. It's awesome because you're teaching them the phrases. So they are expressing themselves. It's just not very sophisticated. Sure. Um, a holistic rubric is actually really helpful. And, and I don't know why that bullet showed up next, but we'll just keep moving along. Um, a holistic rubric is actually really motivating in that holistic rubrics are designed to reward students for what they do well. Analytic rubrics really just like they sound, analyze individual things and give them scores on each one, which can, creates a composite, okay? So 
I'm gonna show you a minute uh, an example of a holistic rubric. So if it's not coming to your mind exactly what I mean, we'll be looking at that just momentarily. So I'm gonna move on to the next bullet. Engaging in authentic catalysts. And by the way, I say catalysts, not prompts. The reason why I don't say prompt anymore is because they have heard that too long in association with standardized tests. So I just stopped saying prompt altogether in my classroom. And it actually, I think, really helped um, because it's kind of like if you say, we're about to do a worksheet, even if you're just handing them a handout, I say handout because they hear worksheet and go, Shh. it's just like, it's a rote response for a lot of them. Catalysts. Because I'm really trying to use it to kickstart the engine of their brain. So I just started using the word catalyst and I, I really, I encourage you to try it. It so actually Julia, makes a difference. For our non-native speakers in here, could you give a brief definition of what a catalyst is? Well, I just think of it as the fire starter or like the catalytic converter, the thing that actually makes your engine fire up and go. Right. And also a catalyst is a chemical that you can add to another chemical that totally changes everything. Sure. So mm -hmm. just to make sure we're on the same page here. Yes. Mm -hmm. A lot of my kids are going to say, I've never seen that word. Before. And you're right. The first time in I use it. Nor in English. Sure, exactly. And the first time I use it, I absolutely define it. Um, very much probably like what you have to do when you're transitioning students who are walking in for the first time to your Spanish, French, or Latin class. I'm sure that you are kind of slowly giving them English definitions as you work together toward the level of immersion you're working for. I have to do the same thing. I'm just defining either terminology that I need them to be familiar with or my own terms that I've come up with to use in my room. Um, Academic English is a language by itself, so I'm having to teach them those things all the time, and I'm defining them within my, you know, speech to them. And you can think in your own languages about something, a word that you could use as a substitute. While she's talking about, about this, since I'm going to be teaching Spanish again this semester, I started thinking, well, I could just use a chispa, a, a spark. Mm -hmm. Here's today's spark, Love a chispa it. de oil. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's great. So you don't, it doesn't have to be that exact <clears throat> word. Right. Um, and the authentic part is really important. I remember, you know, I think we all probably had some sort of experience like this when we first got to have a, a journal or what we might call today a writer's notebook. You might have had those types of uh, prompts that were completely unconnected to what you did that day. Um, and a very well-meaning educator that you loved might have even given you those. The, the, I think the old standard that we use to hold up of what is not good is if you were a tree, what tree would you be? <laughs> now, if, if you were about to teach a lesson on nature or you guys were about to go on a hike, maybe that would make sense. But typically speaking, that example is used because it does not connect to whatever is coming next in the lesson. So making sure that you're giving them something that would spark for them, but also will lay the groundwork for what you're about to do is really the way to make that make the most sense and, and get the most out of it. Opportunities to share or publish, we often call it publish in English, and when we say publish, we don't necessarily mean print it out. We literally mean share it together. Um, it is really important that when students are writing in your classroom that they are given frequent opportunities to share. So even if it's just three sentences, give them the one minute to turn and share it with a partner, or if you're gonna have like the partner interviews or something that piggybacks on it, that counts as you're sharing, but if students are in a classroom where they're frequently jotting either for quick rides or even longer ones and they never share that information, slowly but surely they lose the motivation to stay committed to that topic for whatever length of time you've given them. Um, it puts a little bit of fire in, under them to, to produce something if they know they're going to share. That doesn't mean that you couldn't have personal topics and choose sometimes not to ask them to share. Um, you could maybe on those occasions come up with some sort of data reporting activity instead of a personal share. I have a question. Yes. Uh, when you're, uh, it came to mind when we were talking about that because a colleague that used to teach language, language arts, uh, they did like a journal type of writing, but instead of sharing that day that they did it, it was kind of like the Friday, let's get together, kind of like a circle comfortable. Is it okay to do it? It doesn't have to be done on that day. Could it be done like before the end of the week so that way it's still there? As long as you are showing them that this is the time that I'm going to honor what you created, 
whatever that routine turns out to be, I think any teacher can make that work with their students. So um, I didn't always have time to have them share immediately after, and I frequently had kids who wanted to. Um, so sometimes I would say, you know, put that to the side, we're gonna come back to it at the end of the class day with the last few minutes we have, and I would try to make sure I saved a couple of minutes but if I didn't, they were always very understanding of it, and I sometimes would start the next day that way. So yeah, that has worked for me even when I didn't do it on purpose. Yes. And please tell me if this is a better time to answer this question, but going to what you just said about you want to honor that they've actually committed to this, mm -hmm. I have always wanted to do something like you know writing journals or sure. quick whites or you have to do this many, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But then I'm like, Ugh. I have too many people, and how am I ever? Because I tell them, it's like I'm gonna. If you're gonna write it, I'm gonna read it, and then right. I stop because it's like I can't with so many people. So what is a good as an English teacher? I know y'all sure. do this all the time. What um, is the best way to do that? I mean, I really think it's valuable to have just this constant. But I feel at the same time, it's like I gotta. I can't expect them to do. The I absolute, just feel like I need to see the what they're doing. Truth is, they have to write more than you can read. <laughs> they have to write more than you can read. You can't read everything you need them to write. So. What I generally did was I would give them maybe 10 minutes, either every other day or every day, it kind of depended on what unit we were on, to come in and write in response to whatever catalyst I had posted. And we did have an agreement that if you come in and you're having something you need to work through, you can choose your own topic that day, work through it, you know, because if they come in and you want them to write about a quote from Albert Camus, and they just had a fight in the hallway with their boyfriend, they don't care about Camus. They're gonna write about their boyfriend. And that's okay if they work through it and they're able at the end of that 10 minutes to focus with me on where we're going the rest of the lesson. So what I would do is probably every four times they wrote, collect those things, ask them to put a star on the one that they absolutely wanted to make sure they shared with me. If there was one that they did not wish to share, they could like fold the paper over it or put sticky note. If it was like a short response, they could get sticky notes from my back, um, you know, kind of collection area and cover it up and just write, please not, you know, something like that. I gave them the right to take something away and I gave them right to highlight something um, because you just can't read it all. And to be honest, you don't really need to because probably you're hearing some of what they're sharing from what they wrote at least 50% of the time in the classroom. May I add one more thing to that? Sure. Keep in mind that honoring what they write can also be sharing with somebody else, like getting For in sure. small groups. For sure. Yeah, peer review of the doc documents also can be can validate. I've written something and now somebody's listened to it and responded to it. Right. So I agree with you. There's no way you can do it all. And you really don't want them to think that the only authority in the room is you. Right. It was more just not necessarily For sure. It was just like to say, hey, I this is a really good one, or I really... Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, and you I feel like you want to. It just like sits there and nobody, uh, I don't read it or anybody else... You know, no, I get it. I get it. And I appreciate you asking that it's question. It's a very big... Thank you for giving me... It's a, it's a reason why a lot of people... It's a reason why a lot of people don't assign writing. They but think they have to read it all. You don't. I'm giving you permission not to feel that way. So the follow-up question that I would have is... Um, what kind of a system do you have to be recording grades? Um, how do you deal with that? Because that also becomes, it can become onerous with writing. Sure. You want to have something that's like really truly evidence-based, sure. but you can't, you know, get through it all. Well, I collected all kinds of writing, so you may have to answer that question. But in my room, there were also going to be longer pieces of writing each six weeks. There would be essays that were written in class, what I call on-demand assessments. There would be writing from their writer's notebook. So they were definitely going to get a lot of feedback from me on their writing of various types. With the writer's notebook, I had a rubric that was in part you know, like completion was included in it, but it was also thoughtfulness. And really it was just about, did you commit to the, the catalyst that you were writing to? Did you finish the entry? Um, it wasn't a difficult grade. That might not be a grade I would use as major. I'm not asking about the journal. I'm just talking okay. about making grading manageable. I mean, I teach um, native speakers, for example. Right. And there's a lot of reading. Oh, sure. Sorry, a lot of writing uh -huh. as well. You know, I'm always struggling with, well, what's the best way to do this? You know, so the students are... Holistic rubrics are fast. different from 
yeah. putting a grade in, right? Right. Holistic rubrics are faster. So I think if you want to piggyback on that, and I'll show okay. the rubric right after. Okay. I, I simply want to say that the thing that I think you most importantly need to hear is that every piece of work that they do doesn't have to be a grade, grade, sure. grade. The idea that students would select out of uh, several pieces, the one that they want you to actually assess. The other thing is, and here's where low teachers get in the big trap, is when they start to grade, they get caught up in all the mechanics because there's so many issues with mechanics. Mm -hmm. And so you teachers start grading, they're like, oh my gosh, you're underlining verbs, and blah, 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 blah. Pretty soon you've got this page, and it detracts from the content that the kids are really communicating. So I think it's really important to, number one, those pieces that you read them for content. And years ago when I used to grade this sort of thing, I would always say to students, I'm reading for content. Let's say they write 200 words or whatever. Then I would take, I would read it all and they would have a content grade. And I would only, for mechanics, grade a very small piece of it. And they knew. They didn't know which piece. They didn't know where it would come. But they knew that I wasn't going to go through that whole thing. Plus, you do... You don't tell them, like you don't say this is masculine. You underline it and say, here's a problem, here's a problem, here's a problem. And that goes a lot faster. Figure it out. Or you put symbols, VT, verb tense, whatever. You figure out your system, but you don't spend all that time grading or you will go crazy and you will leave the profession and we need all of you to stay. <laughs> all of you. That's true. It's true. Did you want to say something, Katie? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, so there, there are two things that I was thinking about. So. Austin ISD is now transitioning into blend, which is Austin ISD's version of, of Canvas. And whenever I think of writing submissions mm -hmm. and wanting to acknowledge that they've... Blend is an online environment, just in case some oh, don't know. Oh, yeah, and, and just wanting to acknowledge that they've done something and that you're seeing it, but also acknowledging that you have... 100 plus students and you can't get through all of them. I think of using Canvas as a great tool to quickly provide feedback. Uh, one of the uh, like one of the elements on Canvas is uh, being able to provide really quick comments or highlighting a specific piece. So maybe dedicating like looking at one paragraph or looking at one or two sentences or scanning and quickly providing a, a sentence or a couple of comments, I think goes a really long way. And I think because our students are very like digitally literate and that's a lot to me, I've noticed that that's a lot, uh, that's their motivation to write is th through typing and digital submissions. I think that can also kind of meet their needs. And then whenever I think of grading and providing uh, valuable feedback, something that has helped me in the foreign language classroom is using a self-assessment checklist. And so students are assessing themselves based off of criteria that you're kind of giving them. Um, and I used a template that I kind of found on Actful's website. And then uh, using that same uh, self-assessment checklist and trading it with their partners and having their partners also look and using that checklist as a guideline to kind of save all of us from wanting to pull our hair out. Mm -hmm. so. yep. I wanted to share something as far as very quickly. Oh, no, you're fine. Because I, I, I was an AP, uh, I, uh, I've taught AP Spanish in high school and middle school. This particular kid, yes, eighth graders, AP, Spanish. And we need to prepare them for that uh, the test that they give them. Which test is that? Um, yes, the AP test where they have to write and they have to know how to use the preterite all throughout the writing plus well, we, we, oh, okay, we had to learn the new way, preterite. So, el pasado. No, no, I'm saying that, but some people. And then the kids have to practice a, a good writing, and they have certain time. Now, this is good for the kids that speak Spanish, because if they don't know, they can get a whole semester for in college, paid for. And a lot of the parents are not aware of that. So they, they, I use the holistic rubric. I use that a lot, a lot. And of course, specifically what I'm looking for, either the verb tense, vocabulary, content, 
and I based it on that. But we did have a lot of writing. Great. Yeah. Super. So just to show you um, a holistic rubric that, and this is, I apologize, it's kind of a lot of words on one slide, but it's kind of hard to boil down and do it differently. Um, if you think of it as a four point scale, you're really trying to figure out, is, first of all, is this work upper or lower half, okay? And the upper half, the way I would explain it to the kiddos, and I would use this rubric for all kinds of writing. And that is one thing I would say, if you can create a rubric that you can use for multiple types of writing, that is beneficial to you for speed, getting back to the question that was asked earlier, how do you manage it? But it's most beneficial, and this is the real purpose of a rubric, for the kids, because they can internalize that rubric over time just the same way you can. You get to where you're like walking toward a paper and you can feel what that number is before you even hardly read it, you know? And they will get that good at it too. In fact, if you can work with your vertical team members and create one that you guys can live with for maybe two or three years, then your kids are gonna get real strong. Um, so I would describe the top of the scale. What I would generally say to the kids is this answers the task completely with sophistication. This one lacks the sophistication, but answers the task completely. So it's accurate, but it may not have flair, okay? This is probably where a whole lot of high-performing kids live, right? We don't generally love every task, so it's hard to be sophisticated about something you haven't put your heart into yet, okay? Um, but you wanna have something that honors those moments when they are. This three, this kind of middle, this basically means, I call this the consistently inconsistent paper. It's flip-flopping between these two. And I don't love having five points because it's easy to get you know, too many papers toward the middle. That's the one issue with holistic skills you have to sort of be careful with if you, lose, if you use an odd number. Um, but the truth is, at certain points in writer's development, this is really where they are. They really are flip-flopping. So it makes sense uh, with writing especially to have a little bit more space in your scale. This is an, an, something that does not answer the task, although an attempt is clear. It might, in my area, it might lack sufficient detail. Um, in your area, it might be there are issues with the language that are impeding their ability to impart meaning to the reader, because that is one of the lines in mind too. Writing may convey the writer's ideas, but reveals weak control, may contain many spelling or grammatical errors. If there are enough of these that it fails to be clear, it can actually appear that you have failed to understand or respond to the task appropriately. That's how you get to this bottom area. Now, something that I, I know from working with teachers of pre-AP English, because I was an AP teacher for a long time, they would sometimes say, well, I'd like to use this, but most of my kids are here trying to get to there. What am I gonna do if I have a five-point scale and everybody's getting twos, no one will get an A? And my answer to that is, a rubric has nothing to do with the grade that goes in your grade book. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. This has to be the truth. If you put a two on a paper because that's the truth of where that essay landed, you have to put the two there. Now, if you're working with pre-AP eighth graders and you're using the same five point scale that the senior AP lit teacher uses, why can't a two at pre-AP eighth grade be a 90? If it's the exact same rubric, why couldn't this be something high enough that it showed, wow, if you went in and took that exam, since we're relating it to exams right now, if you went in and took that exam, you would score a four. You know what the median score is for the AP English exams? It's, they're, all of them are four point something. So an eighth grader getting a four is already scoring what the average 12th grader taking that test gets. Why wouldn't that be a 90 in eighth grade? This is just an idea. My point is rubrics are not equivalent to grades. 
grades are what we decide we're gonna connect to the points on the rubric. Holistic, holistic rubrics will definitely help you go faster though, yes. Uh, uh, that's a little bit confusing, sorry. That's a little bit confusing to me. I get, I get the holistic rubric and totally agree that the rubrics are crucial, especially in writing. Um, but if, if you give, so I'm just thinking out loud. So if you've given an assignment and um, the child comes in at a two, um, um, so they've, they've attempted to answer the task but have done so either inaccurately or without support of specific evidence, right. then if I'm having to, to evaluate that, I'll say, well, you didn't quite succeed in what the assignment was. The assignment right. was up here. You came in down here. Therefore, you're at a two. Your grade would be, I don't know, would, would reflect that too. You know what I mean? Right. I, that's why I'm Well, let me clarify. I'm saying if you gave them, if, if we were working with eighth grade students who were trying to work toward the AP literature class, if you gave them a prompt that was very much the same, yeah. you know, maybe just with simplified language, in those practice moments for that AP exam, I think you could make a case for giving them a higher grade for that. If it was a research paper that they had had a whole six weeks to work on, that's not a time when I would make this work toward 90 because they would have had the opportunity probably to conference with you. They would have had multiple sources to consult. So I appreciate you asking that question because I don't want to sound like I'm being too broad in my application. So it would kind of be depending on the stage you are in the, in the, in the, in finalizing your written piece. Sure. Is where, and how, how you much would time it. you had and, and the context. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Right. I want to add, you know, if you go to the Actful website, you can look at the writing descriptions for the different levels. And you can grab a lot of that language and you can use it to develop your rubrics. Because if you have a class of level three, they're almost getting down here for novice level, right? And I would encourage you as LOAT teachers to use the terms novice, intermediate, et cetera, with your students not because, so that they can start feeling some power when they move up from novice to novice high. In an ideal world, wouldn't it be great if that, was, if that were their grade, not A, B, C, D? Wouldn't that be ideal? Honestly, that, Wait, that just one minute. <laughs> we're trying to get all of your great questions. Honestly, the rubric is basically for differentiating. I've had students, like in Spanish, who are way advanced, not just because they're way advanced. I'm going to give them, oh, you scored a 90, when I know they can be more productive. Like I score them like at a probably like a medium level, like an 80 or something. But that's how I differentiate. Then you have your other students. I've had students who have been sped, who they're attempting and are doing fine. That doesn't mean, oh, just because you didn't say it right or presented it right, I'm going to give you a 70 or a 60. No, you did a lot because, first of all, you're getting up there, whether it's a presentation or whatever, you're presenting something, and it does take a lot of what to yeah, it takes a lot. Now, if you're the type of person that goes up there and is just like, can't say anything, that, that's different. I mean, I accommodate my students by either presenting in front of the class or giving me like a presentation on Flipgrid. That's how I differentiate too and the scoring. But that, that is, you can't just base it, oh, just because you're very, you know, you can speak the language, oh. Yeah, no, exactly. No, you, you have to differentiate. At their level. We want to hold the bar higher for those native speakers. Mm -hmm. exactly. Sergio has a question. Well, actually, more than a question. A comment. Okay. Uh, well, looking at the fact of rubric, I would have to think that I'm going to use the rubric at a certain points during the course. Yeah. I'm not going to, because I kind of like get the concept from everyone that they're thinking about the end. Okay. First thing you have to think about students in general is it has to be. Uh, how would you say, it has to be progressive, mm -hmm. it has to be feedback, mm -hmm. and it has to be participative. Because some of the comments are like, the student just doesn't want to do anything. The student is just like sitting down. But the thing is, we have to make the student participate and understand that he's doing it to advance. Mm -hmm. Because, one of the, see, I've been teaching English for many, many years. And one of the problems we had at the beginning of English language teaching, like 20 or 30 years ago, is everybody cared about the final results and very few people cared about how the student was progressing. 
See, in other words, so we're going to put an objective or we're going to put a rubric. I want to give the rubric and then I want to talk or like work with the students. So they say, you know, this has to improve. By the next time I give you another uh, assignment, look at the mistakes you've made, look at the things we're working on, and let's see just how far you can get. We have to make them think that there they have to accomplish. We're not the pullers or the accomplishers for them. Because if we get into that uh, mindset as, as instructors, they're not going to work as hard. We need for them to be, to try to get somewhere. And we need to have feedback so that when we give the course again, we take this feedback, we go back, we modify our objectives, we modify the, the things that we're doing, especially because methodology is always also a, a situation that we have to work with. And basically what we need to do is to have them participate so that they're advancing. We have to see an advancement. Because like you say, one thing is the language because sometimes they just don't have the language level and we have to understand the language level. But maybe the way they express it is very, very good. So you have to have you have to see how you're going to look at the rubric in that, in that aspect. And also keeping in mind the actual can-do statements and using those as well as part of your rubric. What can they do for the specific tasks that you're looking for? Quick writes. We talked about them. You did a quick write. You did a group quick write. Why are they so important and why are they important to the writing process? Starting out, we have the fact that it's your opportunity to among the students and you and your students to promote some personal connections. That's making it more real and authentic for the student. It also gives you an opportunity to assess their knowledge. So you pick up quick writes, they tell you a lot, even though they can do them in the first three or four minutes of class or five minutes. It also, quick writes can be used to summarize so that students can quickly jot down and explain where they are, what they've understood, maybe from something you did the previous day maybe from something they got in the previous year of their language class. Quick writes also encourage critical thinking. And one thing that I really appreciate that Julia said, she talked about the student that comes in too crazy to use her catalyst. Yeah. But the point is you want them writing, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, she also mentioned she's going to transition that student into actually the lesson, whatever that might be. But giving children using their quick writes as an opportunity just to get their energy out on a paper, sometimes that's enough. And then when you pick them up, if you pick them up, and if you do have a chance to scan through them, what you might discover, right? So um, this is where we can predict. For example, you all saw a little video. Mm -hmm. I showed you the beginning. You saw it. If I had just shown you the, the name of the uh, movie, a quick write could be, what do you think this is going to be about? Mm -hmm. What do you see in, for your non-native speakers of Spanish? What is it in the first five minutes that you understood or didn't? What do you infer? from that particular scene from the video. Um, what, what hypothesis are you going to make about the role of this young child as she goes through all that differentiation with her, her new friend? And finally, and this is so very important, and that's promoting reflection. Reflection is an in incredibly powerful tool for learning. It solidifies learning. Yes? How will you be able to do this with Spanish one or with novices. a novice? Okay, mm -hmm. with novices, when they do their initial writing, I would say on day one you can't. Okay. When they're learning, hola, soy Rosa, uh, the quick rate's going to be very boring, right? <laughs> but eventually, <laughs> there are many, many things that kids can do that are even novices. Now, their writing's going to be slower, and you might only give them a two-minute quick write. But you can ask them a question like, um, uh, Describe the weather in Alaska. Describe the weather in Alaska in the summer. You know what I mean? And just write about it. And then they'll write little things. Mucho frío. Uh, hielo. Um, llueve, no mucho. Or whatever. They're going to write, I said, snow, rain. They'll just put down what they've learned. They're pieces. So they, they can... Words only. Right. Probably at novice letter. Yeah. They can make a list. The year quick write for level one could be write down all the subjects you've taken in high school. If you're doing that, right? You've got the point where they're talking about academics. They can make an advertisement. They could make an ad for something. But, in a, but the quick write really isn't producing such a fine product. It's just like getting, the, it's kind of like brainstorming at the level one. Just, yeah. <laughs> Guess who's going to get their exercise today? <laughs> um, I wanted to say, uh, 
I've taught from level one all the way to four AP. And um, I've used the uh, images, pictures, uh, videos, but not the whole video, just to get them to attract and get their attention. And that could be from the level, like you were saying, if it's a one and if I'm going, depending on where you're going with the video, uh, let's say you wanted it to do colors and you have something that you show a little bit of color so you can ask them, you know, list the colors that you know yeah. in the target language. And or and and the writing the or the oh, what colors do you see or what pops? So it doesn't. I think uh, the biggest aha that I had a couple of years ago is that at least personally, me, you know, I'm thinking, okay, what can they do? The kid do at the end with this piece, and because you want them to do so much, you're thinking all this elaborate things. But then the reality is, well, at what levels are they? And then at that level, being able to make a list, you know what? You accomplished it because that is at the level that you're at. Now, I would expect my 4AP student to do much more than that. But, you know, so that I, that's why it's great that we have all these guidelines with the ACTFL and all that because it really shows you the I can do what the student can do at different levels and, and things like that. Those it's, are the magic words. It seems like, too, I'm, I'm just throwing this out because I'm not a language teacher, so y'all feel free to tell me I'm wrong. She does have a minor in Spanish. <laughs> but I was thinking they could probably, in their early quick writes, use, if you had maybe matte pencils available, they could use the words they know, but also maybe draw images of things they don't have words for. And they could use the colors to, like, inflect it with tone. Um, it's just a thought. No, no, it's no, a great it's thought. True. It's yeah. a great thought. Mm -hmm. Sure. Say it again. Um, I was just thinking they could use the words they have, however limited they are, and then they could draw images for the words they don't have so that they are mentally engaging with it and maybe setting you up to help them with some interesting vocabulary that they're just interested in. Yes, and making them interested. Yes. Mm -hmm. And saying, gee, I did all this Spanish. I wonder how you do say cranberries. Right. Look that up. I know that's a real word, but really strange <laughs> choice. But anyway, so um, I want to really focus on what you said, thinking about what they can do right. yes. at their level and having the expectation be what they can do because they will be very proud when they can do it. I think, to, you know, going to the reflection, we often think of quick writes as a way to introduce something or lay the groundwork for something, but you know, your engagement can serve a lot of needs. So kind of piggybacking on something that Sergio and also Katie remarked something about it earlier. If you have them working on something long-term and they are thinking about that rubric because they're working on it long-term, they could come in and the quick write could be, where do you think you fall on the rubric based on what you've done so far? And write two sentences to support your assessment. Right. I mean, if you're going to be doing some peer grouping or working on a project in small groups, it would probably be good for them to have some quiet time to think a little bit about where they really are before they go into that minute uh, with those kids. Super. Um, building specific skills, you can use RAFT. This is a strategy for creating um, writing catalysts. And it's an acronym. It does stand for Role, Audience, Format, and Topic. I'm going to explain what each of those are on this next page. Oh, did you want to? Hold on. Let me get a picture. Well, hold on just a minute. <coughs> because is the next one showing a sample yes. wrapped assignment? Okay, before we go there. No, it's going to explain it first. I'm but we haven't it. seen the good cartoon oh. by Mafalda oh, right. and talked yes. about <laughs> integrating culture. <laughs> okay. So well, we, that, you, we as, you know, all low teachers, <laughs> we've got to integrate that culture, right? So if you'll kind of click back once. I will. Okay. So building specific skills means a lot of different things. And Julia is going to talk specifically about RAFT. But I've got two other things here for you to look at. One is the idea of taking comics and getting rid of the words and then letting, see what the kids come up with with that. Mm -hmm. And some of you may recognize, this is Mafalda. She's from Argentina. So it's kind of sneaking culture in as well, especially this particular comic because she's very philosophical. And actually, 
you could do a quick write based on what this cartoon is, which now you can do it forward. The original words were, the little girl's building all these things. She's putting smiley faces, and the mother says, what the heck is that? And she says, nothing. I just wanted to see what it would feel like to be sexy. She's got all the, everybody looking at her smiling. <laughs> so that's what the cartoon is about. So this one is just an image that I use um, as a template for the students to have like an angel devil activity. And you can do it for multiple things. I think the one that I shared with my 640 class was if your brother or sister were going out on their first date and you were the good <laughs> sister, what advice would you give them? If you were the bad sister, what advice would you give them or brother? So you, that gets into a variety of language levels, right? You could even list probably, you know, no besar, don't kiss, whatever. And little novices could come up with a list of things not to do. You could get up to um, just command forms at level two, intermediate, and you can get into subjunctive, I suggest you do this, I insist that you do that, I, I refuse to allow my sister to do whatever. So you can really take that one image and you can use it over multiple levels. Always consider how can I reuse this in a different way? Okay, so go ahead. I'm sorry for... No, you're fine. Okay. I appreciate you slowing me down. So. The role of the writer, in essence, you're going to give the student a role. And one of the things that's nice about using this uh, strategy is it makes sure that you keep things varied um, in addition to the fact that you can give them different types of catalysts for different genres. It will help you think of more creative ways to put them in situations, um, provided that they're authentic. You always want to be going for what's authentic. So who are you as the writer in this moment? Um, are you the principal? That was one I know in the English classroom we use a lot when we're having kids write arguments because we'll frequently want them to write, uh, to change something about the school that they feel like is unfair or unjust. Um, are you a bystander? You know, you can come up with virtually anything that makes sense to the unit that you're working in and their capabilities with respect to language, of course. Um, and to whom are you writing? Another thing that's really important for us uh, in the English world, especially about um, this strategy, is that we're always trying to get kids to think about the connection and the role of the audience and how you frame whatever it is that you're going to say. Um, so anytime you're writing, you've got to be thinking about the audience. That's a really important concern. So to whom are you writing? Um, is it a grandparent? Is it your best friend? Probably in their early writing experiences, we're choosing people that they're very close to like that. Um, format, in what form or format are you going to write this? A lot of times you might not have a format in mind and that's fine, they can write free verse, um, but other times you want them to use a particular form. It might be an advertisement or a postcard, a letter, a mission statement. It doesn't have to be something long per se, and it could be something very informal like a list, especially when you're getting started. A topic, obviously, what are you writing about? So that kind of goes back to whatever the catalyst you've selected is um, that connects to your underlying uh, concepts for the whole unit. So is this a personal memory in this case, a societal issue, etc. So here's an example. I'm going to post this example. I want you to think real quick, role, audience, format, topic, because I'm going to ask you to turn in with a partner, identify the role, audience, format, and topic in the sample that I'm going to show you, okay? So, imagine that you work for a museum created just for students from your high school. You have been tasked with creating a display that serves to convey the various student groups or cliques that exist in your campus environment. Make a list of artifacts you might include in your display and jot notes regarding what each artifact symbolizes. So, with your partner, identify the role, the audience, the format, and the topic. You can just talk it out. So, who would like to tell us the role? Anybody feel confident about the role? No one feels confident. Monica. You are the curator or other employee of the museum. Perfect. You're a museum curator. If you like my, not all of my students probably would have known the word curator. Unfortunately, some of my high school students had not been to museums very often in their lives, but they would have said, you're a museum worker. That might have been how it came out, and that's fine, okay? A museum curator, and let's see, how about audience? Who is your audience? Student body. 
the student body of your high school, perfect. The museum has been created just for them, so they are the individuals who will see whatever work you are putting together. All right, and what is your format or form? It's a list. You could have said a list of artifacts if you liked, but it's technically, it's just a list, okay? And then what is your topic? I feel like I heard like a couple of different things. It could be like a, you know, picture database, you know, internet database or something, you know? Sure, the artifacts themselves could take various forms, but they will all be artifacts that symbolize what? Perfect. Okay, so our topic is really the subject that we've been already talking about a little bit. This connects to that unit that we've been fashioning. So if I were having them explore that specific topic, I might have them write to this quick write. Probably the day after we had spoken about it or maybe later in the class. That's so awesome, Julia, because I haven't seen, I just noticed a slide. We didn't review it the other day. Oh, okay. I really like it, good job. I like how she's tied this particular slide into everything else we've been doing today. And I just wanna say one more thing that's awesome about, would you go back to the previous slide? Not the example, but the for the role R A F T. I think our battery role is audience. Really tired. Oh. Well, anyway, tired. so the other thing that you can do with this also is give your kids options. You can give them the uh, the, the audience, the uh, task, etc. But you can change. They can change. You guys can choose which role you want to be. Do you want, for example, uh, you could be, let's say. You're, you're going to be writing a letter or a note or something to somebody going off to college. You could be the parent writing it. You could be the best friend that's going to lose their best friend. You could be a pair of shoes that's obviously been left behind because they're not cool enough to go off to college. So you could have, you can change these out and give the kids more than one option and you'll find that certain kids would appeal to different things, right? And even probably in this, you see what I'm saying? So depending on what your goal of the writing is, this um, beautiful example that Julia created for us definitely is going to feed right into what we've been talking about today. This fits our lesson that we're designing, right? But keep in mind this particular, as you start your task this afternoon, if you decide you're going to have this type of task, you want to put a wrapped assignment in it, there are uh, many approaches to it. Um, do you have, right, right up here, Mike first up here. Okay, but yeah, just a minute. Piedad, which is a beautiful name. Yeah, Hansa, well, I, I love your name. I talked in Defense Language Institute. Oh, great. And when we teach writing with different languages, sometimes uh, uh, because English has is very advanced in the structure, mm -hmm. uh, but they differ with different languages. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the structure for writing uh, how to write in the target language is completely different from English. Absolutely. So in other words, sometimes the formats the that they push ESL, we cannot apply to the other target language because the main the main idea usually is in the first paragraph, mm -hmm. but in Arab or in other uh, languages, the first idea the main idea is not in the first paragraph in the which first line be, of the paragraph. Which would be so? How do you how do you approach that in Writing. But look at this. Arabic teacher. Mm -hmm. I've got a couple Arabic. Are you, do you teach Arabic? Turkish, which is somewhat similar. So can you apply this to teaching your kids? Sure. But I was going to say, like, when it comes to, like, sort of trying to get them to, particularly, like, at the intermediate, high, mm -hmm. advanced Thank level, you. I try to vary the formats that they're writing. Yeah. a lot and sometimes uh you have to model the formats that are right far from english formats yeah. you know it's this, a good thing to have a model i mean this idea of like spiraling around the subject and to getting to your main point at the end mm -hmm. is so backwards to all of them that mm -hmm. they often don't get it until they've seen a couple of pieces that look like yeah. it then remember that i have the model lesson plan for you to look at mm -hmm. okay so absolutely, models are wonderful. Models are wonderful. And if you can get those models from previous students, they're even more wonderful mm -hmm. because the students see what other students have produced. So models, absolutely, yes.
I have a question. So I I really like uh, this catalyst, uh, and I would love to use it in the foreign language classroom. Uh, Natalia and I work with Spanish one students, so I'm curious if anyone has any feedback or suggestions on how we could use this same theme um, of this catalyst, but how could we differentiate it to meet our students' level level. ones. Well, I think Jeanette kind of pegged it. Do you remember your comment? Modeling models? models? Before that? <laughs> she talked about using images. She talked about, remember that your, your novices are going to be doing things like listing or, you know, they're, or making a mind map. Yeah. Mind mapping would be an awesome thing for novices to do that they could be very successful at. Um, when I, I like using um, modismos. Uh, I'm forgetting how to say it, idioms. Um, and so one of the things that I do is introduce it and then they have to make up a little story about it. And I let the, I say, whatever words you can do in Spanish, put them in Spanish. And then everything else, put it in English. And then we go back over it and over it and over it. This is coming out of um, uh, CUNY work on translanguaging. And I found it to be so interesting that the kids just love sharing it and then they help each other you know get it into better Spanish like they put it up on the board right and they can all work on it yeah together. and that's that's another way of like moving something forward and if you include that in some of the previous work then they also have more language you know to use and to to integrate in as they go. Yeah, whatever can motivate them to start saying, gee, I'd like to go figure out how to say that. It's great. Okay. I, I'm, I'm gonna share my, my experience. I'm an ESL teacher. So my kids come from, um, either from uh, the, my goodness, I went blank. Um, Mexico or Central America. But I also have students from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from Turkish, and we need to uh, bring them to the English language. So I use a lot of pictures. First of all, we talk about cognates. I watch a lot of Turkish uh, series. So I found myself a lot of cognates, police, um, pardon. And so I bring them into the classroom, and once they start rec recognizing, they can uh, translate, they can understand what is being said in English because they have no knowledge of English. But I do a lot of pictures. They go and draw themselves uh, the picture of what they understand about the pictures. And that's how I've been doing it for the past year. It hasn't been easy. All right. You ready, Julia? I'm sorry. Did the battery die? I think it. I think it's working again. It's just. It has a mind of its own. Okay. <laughs> See that great. <laughs> See that great response I got from y'all with that one. Okay. I'm just. I just put this up here because I love this kind of thing, and I love it as a warm up, or I love it as a brain teaser, and as you just look at it, there's just so many directions you can go with it. Getting the kids to fill in what somebody's thinking. You could have it be talking, speaking, or whatever you want to do with these little things. But I love vintage pictures, and you can find vintage, old cartoons and stuff in your lot. Say in your own language. So if you're a Spanish teacher, if you look up old Spanish vintage cartoons, you're going to find something for that. If you're Turkish. Arabic, French, whatever you're teaching, you're going to be able to find old vintage pictures, and you're just sneaking in culture. Mm -hmm. Just like with the Mafalda, you're just sneaking it in there, just having it there for them to see. I'm not going to ask y'all to do this, because, but I know it would be very clever. This is the actual picture it came from. Notice, you could, ask, you could evoke subjunctive from them. What is he demanding? What will his revenge be? Past tense. When they met, conditional. What would you do? Present. He reacts. So keep in mind, you could use this how many times? Even more, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, you could even say, what colors do you see in this picture yeah. <laughs> with your novices? Although I probably wouldn't ask you to do that because the kids would go crazy if they saw that picture. But you can find, <laughs> you can find something appropriate, right? <laughs> Same thing here, building specific skills, letter writing prompts. This time using Dick, Jane, and Sally. or I, this, I'm using all this old vintage stuff from English. But you can use things from Game of Thrones. You can use things from all kinds of 
current popular um, culture today that the kids would be interested in and just think about it. What about the same things, right? What does he demand? What does Dick demand that? What the future will be? What revenge will Sally have, et cetera? Go ahead. Um, I don't want to belabor this point because I feel like we've already allude, alluded to it multi multiple times. Sorry about that. Um, you definitely want to approach writing as a process the same way we've spoken at length about, you know, giving them time to build up their language and treating that as a process. Anything that they do that you expect a real polish to come from needs to be done over time. Um, ideally with, as Sergio said earlier, the, you having some, you know, conference with them, um, talking with them about what's going on in their process. Um, I would say there are a lot of things that pop up that are common between teenagers in their writing processes, but that everybody has their own individual process at the end of the day. Some people need to do what I call percolate for a long time. Um, the kiddo that seems to not be doing it is often living with the topic in his or her own private space for a week before it actually hits the paper. So I always encourage people not to think a student isn't being lazy, you know, um, to assume that they're not going to do the work just because you don't see it right away. Some people literally have to live with it for a while. Um, I'm one of those people, although I, I was also a good student, so I, I have my stuff by my due dates. But anyway, it's, it's a good thing to remember. And cognitive and metacognitive training impacts writing. So did you want to add anything to that? I just want to say that every time we put them in a reflective mode so that they're thinking about what they're doing, every time we use those I can statements with the students where they're really thinking about their learning process, all that's going to support and promote what they do on paper. And their, of course, oral skills. And you know the writing is what's so important to develop their oral communication. So... so when, when we're talking about process, and, and I'm, we're going to kind of talk together because, again, right. I want to get the low perspective on it. But generally speaking, another thing that I kind of changed in my own classroom was I moved to call it, calling it generative writing. And that is because as I used the word pre-write, I found like they had different definitions of what that meant on the basis of the teachers that they had had and also on the basis of what pre-writing strategies worked for them. Um, students who like to web or list, they will always say that they pre-write. Students who pre-write or generate in free verse think that that's their first draft. Mm -hmm. So they don't think they're pre-writing because of the fact that their pre-write happens in complete sentences. So I just moved to calling it generative writing so they would know if we are in the generative mode, everything we're doing right now is building towards something, but nothing is your quote unquote draft, okay? Um, that helped me get clarity with them. And especially if you work with high school or college level students, the number of them that do pre-write in prose form is much higher. So you probably have a lot of kids who are jumping in and have something that looks like a paper that they are in no way clear about when they're writing it. I'm sure you've had the phenomenon of reading that and halfway through the paper, you're like, oh, now we're, now we're getting somewhere. And by the end of the paper, you understand what they mean and what they believe, but they didn't even know what it was until about three quarters of the way through the paper. That is a clear mark of someone who is pre-writing, but it's in prose form. So I'm gonna encourage you to think about the generative term. Just real quick, is this, did y'all say that this PowerPoint is available to, that we have access to this it's, or no? You will have access to it. I don't know if we've sent you the PDF yet or not, but there, the PDF will be loaded along with all of your, okay. yes. the work you do today. Okay. I'll send it right before we leave today. There's a lot of different um, strategies for generating or pre-writing out there. We just have a small sampling here. Um, and it's important that students, in my personal opinion, it's important that students be given lots of different strategies to choose from because they will not all work for various individuals. Um, I am not a person who is a mind mapper. I had to learn it so that I could teach it to students so that I could give them that tool. And some of you might be like me. I had to go and basically fake a mind map and, you know, and then... I'm improvising, but not really because <laughs> I've sort of like got down what we're going to do. I got better at that as time went on, but that is not how my brain works. And if you required that of me as part of my grade, 
it would be very difficult for me to do it. And I would probably just go home, write the paper, come up with a map that mm -hmm. faked that paper, and then give you that. We're, some people have the same issue with outlining. So it's really important that you give them those strategies, but then I think it's important that you let them choose from the strategies that work for them. Mm -hmm. And I think probably building bridges with the folks in your English language arts areas or in your, you know, the English departments on your campus could be helpful to that because saving yourself time of finding out what they're already familiar with from other folks on your campus would be helpful, I would think. I only want to change one word. She said it would be helpful. It will absolutely be helpful okay. if you connect with your ELA teachers. Absolutely. I think this one's you. I'm going to let you do the writing process okay. unless I have a comment. That's fine. Um, so composing a draft once you get to that point, and you can kind of create um, a way that will clearly indicate that to them, or you can just make it organic. It, the more you teach writing, the more comfortable you'll be with giving some of that control over, but it's very hard in the beginning to give that amount of freedom that you might ultimately be striving to give. Um, one of the things that I did in my high school classroom was when you're ready to go to a draft in our classroom, that was when we went to the computers. I tended to want people to start with their hand until we were in that mode where you knew you had something that you wanted to say in a more permanent way. That was when we pulled out the laptops. Uh, I was lucky enough to have laptops. Um, you definitely want to always be focusing on the audience, and I would say revising, and this is my terminology here for content and style, should happen after they have a draft that they're a little more committed to. There's really no point in starting to work on the grammar and making sure all the language is perfect if they only have 50% of something and they're not even really sure they want to live with it. Um, that just creates frustration because it means twice the amount of work for them, and it could be uh, potentially you know, they're coming into tutorials for the first one, but then they don't come for the one that they actually end up wanting to submit uh, for an assessment. So I, I would try to create peer groups and, and get them listening to each other and have them reading it to each other. Um, even in my English language classroom, I did not let them switch papers to read each other's papers until they had a draft they had like finished and maybe even went to second draft. Because in English, you have the kiddos who want to just start correcting their grammar and spelling the same way you might have better speakers trying to do the same thing for your speakers who are still growing. And you really kind of want to keep them from doing that. So letting them read it also trains them to catch their own mistakes. So try to keep them in their own hands. They won't want to read the papers out loud. If you've never done this before, I'm just going to tell you right now. They will not want to read those papers out loud, but you have to just be like, it's going to be great. We're all going to mess up together. I can't wait um, and, and create sort of enthusiasm for it. And we always revise for content before we revise for style. That is the same thing as editing. So if you're thinking, where does edit enter the picture? That's really what revising for style is about. Um, but I feel like if you call it revision for style, it elevates it because if you say edit, they just think you mean check spelling um, or maybe check commas, but usually don't really get very good comma checks. But if you say revise for style, it becomes a different thing. Then it's about going back and refining the words and the structures in order to have a greater impact on your audience. It's a little different than, okay, edit it and turn it in. And if you want, you can follow that up with the edit, you know, right before you turn it in, just because it's the last check. But during the revision for content and for cell, they should always be coming back to whatever that rubric is. Hopefully it's one that they've seen before, but even if it's not, that's all the more reason they need to be looking at it all the time. I just wanna add that what she has here in parentheses or what we have here in parentheses, the one, two, three, allowing the students to know that your final product, the first revision isn't gonna be it, right? You're gonna keep working on it and making it better. And Without that, they may as well just be submitting a draft. So there's a question. Yeah. We have our microphone. Um, I guess I, I was going to throw this question out to, to everyone. One of the struggles, especially at a little bit more advanced levels, is, that, uh, is how to use and incorporate and encourage uh, the use of online translators mm -hmm. and how the students, some students, I mean, you can tell that they have entered entire paragraphs and you get a perfect paragraph back 
at the same time, it's a reality, right? And they can, and those, those translators are there to be used. Uh, I found it difficult to balance that. Um, so they're either doing all their work in the classroom, um, or I have to, you know, pull them aside later and say, hey, you know, this was not written by you. It was written by you, but probably in English, and you just stuck it in no translate. You know what I mean? So it's, that's a tough one. May I respond to that yeah. first, and then I'll get back to Monica. I just want to give you a little bit of background. Do you remember when spell check came out? Mm -hmm. And everybody said what horrible spellers spell check was going to make because they were going to check your spelling. I want to say that my spelling is vastly improved because of spell check because I do use it and I see it. And those of you who know me well know I suffer from mild dyslexia, so I make a lot of weird spelling errors anyway. So for me personally, I love spell check. I always use it, and I think my spelling's better. I know it's better because I don't have to use it as often. So it was... I like that tool. Yeah. I'm going to tell you something else. I've been uh, learning French over the past few years, and I have friends in France. This one woman in Lyon came to see me recently. I communicate with her only in French. Every time I send her a text or anything, I put it into Google Translate. It always has mistakes. Yeah. It's never right, but I take it, I look at it, I fix the mistakes. Oftentimes it's always informal. I change it to informal, I fix it, right? And she came to visit me, she said, and my French is terrible by comparison, right, with those perfect things I said. But she said, oh, Rose, you write so well in French. And I'm like, mm, right, exactly. But here's the point. I have learned so much from fixing that French. So two ways of looking at this. This is my personal. Now, I haven't taught writing in the Spanish classroom for a long time because I've been out of that field. I'm about to go back into it. So what I would say is one of two things. If you can put something in Google and fix it, and I get it and it really is perfect, you've done something right. You can do, you kind of can manipulate, you're talking about advanced kids, right? Correct. So they're kind of learning how to use that tool. And I think it's an incredible tool to be able to know how to use if you go into, any, into the job market, to be able to look at Spanish and see if it's wrong. Now, that's not an accurate um, display of what they do. So that's where in-class writing is going to come in hand in hand. So I think you would probably, and this, you guys can tell me I'm full of craziness, but to me, I would rather say, yeah, go to Google Translate, put it in, fix all the errors on that particular document. Mm -hmm. This one we're going to do in class, and you're not going to use a computer at all. You're going to handwrite it. And that's going to be more authentic, right? Mm -hmm. For But it's not going to be your polished finest piece, final piece. But if you do the writing process, and they're doing a lot on paper first, as Julia suggested, hopefully they'll move forward without necessarily going to Google Translate. But I think that it's okay to let them know that that tool exists for them because they, I, I use it all the time. I use it in Spanish sometimes. I have to write a whole big long thing in Spanish, and I think better in English because I'm a native speaker of English. I'll put it into Google, take it out, put it on paper, and I see all the mistakes in Spanish. I fix them, and it saved me about 15 minutes rather than having to go through the whole thing. Um, I, this year is the first time that I've let students do that in my class, and what I found was, oh, sorry. <laughs> this year is the first year I've um, used Google Translate in my class at all. In my school, if a student turns in an essay using Google Translate, and that's all they've done, it's plagiarism. It's not yeah, accepted. It is. But what I started doing was, okay, you're going to write your first draft in in Spanish, and then you're going to take it, and then I show them how to use it. Take it sentence by sentence. You're not going to put the whole thing in. You're going to flip it back and forth between the English yes. and the Spanish to see what you're getting, and then you're going to review it. Yeah. Um, I had them review it with me. Um, before you turn in your final, final draft. Well, they loved it because they got immediate feedback. Right. They had to figure out things. And then when I had to look at it, there was a lot less work that a lot I had easier to, to do. <laughs> yeah. And I found that it worked. I was so surprised, but I found that it really worked well. I want to add one thing, and then we're going to go to Monica. And that is, I am talking about advanced students. Mm -hmm. Novices yeah. can't do that. Intermediates, <laughs> they don't have the skill set. I'm talking about your really advanced kids. Yeah, your advanced kids. Okay, Monica. I have to say, I'm the complete opposite. I was very frustrated the, when I started teaching the AP level a few years ago. Um, it's like, oh, you know, outside, you know, have all the time that you want to work on it and da-da-da. And so, not all, but so many of them, you could just, it was just flat Google Translate. And I said, forget it. So I've become like, nope. 
Anything that is for a grade that is supposed to be abolished, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you sit down in class, have a dictionary, which I have no problem with them using, mm -hmm. same thing, and a little grammar whatever. cheat sheet thingy yeah. or whatever, perfect. Yeah. And if you can do it by using that, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But it's so easy. Um, and a lot of them, your advanced students would do the, oh, let me see what Google Translate did. Now let me see what I did. Now, oh, yeah. The majority of the kids are just going to go straight, copy yeah, yeah, straight, yeah, 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 yeah. copy paste here. Mm -hmm. Good enough. Well, if you and can, that's very frustrating. If you can so. see that it's Google Translate, then it's plagiarism, like you say, right? But so. I, then sometimes you have to go through these hoops. I mean, I remember spending my time back translating to prove to this girl that you actually did use, you know, with the parents and everything. It's like. No, here's how she did it. I was like in my mind, like, is she probably said this, and then that's why it came out like this. It was well, a very frustrating like, thing. That sounds like a lot of work, which is why I would definitely differentiate. Yeah. In other words, when I'm saying that I would let them use that, it would be for specific things. But then you would want to make sure you had something authentic in the classroom to really see where they stood. But that's what they're going to have to do on the exams anyway. Exactly. Like sitting down and doing it. That's right. And that's why when you see their authentic work and you say to the parents, there's no way they could have written this because, look, this is their writing sample. So you've got, you've got to have writing samples that are authentic. There's no doubt about it. But I've, for myself and my own personal growth, I've watched how much it's helped me in French. And so I have kind of a little different perspective than I would have had because I hadn't been through it myself. And I think there are definitely kids like you, like me, that are like, like oh, us. I love this, you know. I love this. I'm That's a darling. We're going to figure this out, and I'm going to see where my mistakes are. But the unfortunate majority is that majority are not. They're like, what do I got to do? Well, if they're not, they're, not, like, well, they're, they're, not, they're giving you bad stuff because right. Google Translate makes too many mistakes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is fortunate for us as educators because you can tell. Mm -hmm. They make really bad mistakes that just pop out to you all the time. So any other comment about this? Yes. I hate to admit it, but I know of a few students that would rather not do the assignment and no. then at yeah. home get a native trend, a native speaker or whoever friend, or like you say, Google Translate, and then do it at uh, more professionally, and then not actually go through the process. Is there a way to? Avoid that. There's no way to avoid cheating. <laughs> it, it's just going to happen. I think part of this is going to come into your classroom that you set up, your feeling that they all have together, giving them opportunities for success. As Julia said with the rubric, you're not expected to be up here. This is fine. Letting them know that they're going to have in-class writings that you're going to use as a standard for what you know they can do. And when they send the work into you that's a native speaker work or whatever, just totally not accepting it. And having the discussion when you know that cheating's taking place. Because I think a lot of us as educators don't sit down and take the 30 minutes and tell the Joe Fallhaber story. We just don't do it. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think that's, that's what the only thing you can do to stop it is just say... Sorry, I can't accept this. You didn't. Um, no. I have any, even this was mind blowing to me. I also teach um, IB in my school. So there was this written assignment that they have to do outside of class. And this is towards the end, you know, three quarters through the year. Had, so I knew at this point what, what kids could do. They turn in this rough draft, and I'm like, no way. No way did you do this. And I said, did you have somebody? Well, yeah, my mom. I said, but I told you, you know, you, you, I told you, you cannot do that. So we had to, instead of doing theirs outside of class, we literally made them go to the library and redo the whole thing sitting there under the watchful eyes of the librarian and their dictionary and their grammar sheet. Yeah. So it's not only just, it's the kids that you think, are you kidding me? I can't believe you would do this. Mm -hmm. And again, they're just trying to... Um, to get it done, and that's what we had to do. Is like this is so blatantly not yours. <laughs> look what you've done to me, and look what you turn, and just. And I think once other people see that you did that, then maybe be less inclined to to do that. But sometimes they're desperate. <laughs> so I noticed none of you flinched when I said the Joe Fall Hubbard story. But when I was a high school teacher, I had an old boyfriend. We lived up in Alaska. 
And one night we were going to go make some dinner and there were these grapes there and they cost about, in 1975 or something, they cost about $8 a pound. So imagine today's prices. And I went by and I looked at one and I ate it. It was terrible. It was sour and awful. And we walked away to get something else. And he looked at me and said, why did you take, why did you steal that grape? I said, what are you talking about? He said, you just stole a grape. I said, no, I didn't. I tasted it. We're not going to buy it and spend $8 a pound on these grapes. He said, what if everybody came in the store and did that? He just stole a grape from the owner of the store. He said, so like if you, found, if you saw a lady walking ahead and she dropped $10, would you keep it? I said, well, of course not. What if it were $100? Would you keep it? No. What about, what about a million dollars? Like you have a million dollars in your bank. Nobody can trace it. Are you going to keep it? And I went, oh. And he looked at me and said, well, I'm glad to know that your honor is worth a million dollars and not one grape. And I went, and I started thinking about things a little bit differently. And that's the story I used to share with my kids. The story of what is your honor worth? Is it worth cheating on this paper? Is that worth it to you? So that you make an extra two points on your GPA? And they say yes. Maybe it is. <laughs> and if it is, if it is, and if it is, if it is, then you're selling your honor cheap. Then you're selling your honor cheap. Well, I don't know. And if they don't have a problem with it, then you just do what you say and you don't accept the grade and you go through. But I'm saying that they don't think about it. Nobody sits down to them and tells them and has a big cheating conversation. It's very rare. So take it upon yourself to have. They don't even think it's cheating. They really don't. But how are they going to think that unless somebody tells them? I think uh, in, in my area, the thing that everybody gets you know, all upset about is whether or not the kids are really authentically reading, i.e., did they actually read the whole book? Did they just yeah. read the first two chapters and then start reading spark notes? And I think we all know the answer is that sometimes they read the whole book and sometimes they don't read very much of the book at all. And I think we probably know that because we know people who did that when we were in school. I mean, it's not new, wow. you know? <laughs> and, and I always felt like, I mean, I have a pretty good sense of when a student is giving me an idea that's not authentically theirs simply because they were writing in lots of other ways in my room. So sometimes it comes across in, in the reading. And and I'll, we did use turnitin.com and things like that. So for, for longer things or things they did at home, they had to submit them to something that would check it for plagiarism, which was the best part about that was really that it taught kids how much you should rely on excerpts and how much you should use your own words because a lot of them don't mean to plagiarize. They're just using a ridiculous percentage of material from someone else's writing. So that was really good in that way. And I had a lot of colleagues who would get really caught up in this. And you definitely have those strange years where the whole class is sort of characterized by cheating and you have to come up with a different tactic like doing everything in the classroom and it's probably not just you, it's probably people across the grade level who are serving those students. Um, I know in my experience that was almost always more true when I had a larger number of very competitive, high-performing kids. They are the ones who I think have the biggest problems with cheating, and it's because, unfortunately, their stakes are so high. Um, and sometimes they have, in my experience, very unrealistic pressure from their parents. That's just the observation that I have made personally. But I also have to believe, like, I can't, I, I, was, I was always cognizant of not, for me personally, just compared to a couple of my colleagues, turning it into this idea that I was going to catch all cheaters because then you create, like you can slip into an adversary mode, you know, and I definitely had a few research papers where I thought this is not authentic and I probably scoured the internet and realized after an hour, okay, I'm never, like I need to let this go because the other natural consequence of not having done it yourself, I mean, it's going to show up in a moment. They think they're desperate now, but sometime when they need that knowledge, they're going to really know what desperation is. And I just sort of like learned to turn it over to the universe. Um, and it was, and, and it helped me so much because I, I mean, people I really respect as educators, a couple of them just kind of could get consumed by that concern. Um, and it is frustrating when you're teaching literature and they're not reading the book. I don't mean to say I don't share the frustration. Um, but 
the alternative that some of some people started to move to was not assigning books anymore, and I just couldn't conceive of a world like that. Well, for, yeah. for us, especially yeah. in that specific example, is at the end of the day when they turn in this thing, you have to sign as a teacher saying, right. I verify that this, to my best knowledge, is students' mm -hmm. own work. And it's like, I just couldn't let that one go. You know, I couldn't yeah, yeah. let that, because like, no, it's not. It is not. And yeah. it's a lot of extra effort, and it's just it's just very frustrating. When yeah. You get, you think, oh, I feel so kind of, not sad for them, but it's like, they're so desperate for these GPA right. these yeah. grades and these this and that. And the other thing that's the, that's the kind of stuff that I think it would be really worthwhile then to maybe three or four times in the semester in class have a where are we? Ten minute write where you compile it and you have their little portfolio. And so when they turn in something that's clearly native speaker quality and they're intermediate high, you can sit down with the parent and say, There's no way that the person that writes like this in class writes like this outside of class. And I, you know, you hate to get to that point where it's always about the kids cheating, and that's why it's so important for them to know your expectation and that you understand the stress that they're under and that they need to be coming to you. You know, it's I do. I do feel like when I started having kids, by the last five years of my uh, time in public uh, high school, I had them grade almost everything they tr they gave me before they turned it in. And I would somewhere like maybe halfway in the process, have them do a little checkpoint. Um, I think that helped. I think grading a little bit for growth helped. Um, mm -hmm. Even in my upper level classes, I did that um, because I think they figured out that it wasn't really all about the grade and that I was going to give them opportunities to raise their grade if they didn't do well, because I, I gave them opportunities to rewrite at least twice a semester. Um, and that helped me. I don't know that that helps in every way. Like I said, I'm sure I still had the fake reader. I'm not trying to think I caught them all. <laughs> um, I'm sure I didn't. But I also feel like to some extent, if you were, I guess, reading enough of, critiques of the piece to be able to fool me through discussions and written work, you probably could have just read the book. I mean, like, <laughs> maybe you read just as much as the people who read the book, but you just read all <laughs> critical analysis, you know? Um, so th that's just sort of how I, like, made my peace with it. Yeah. But it, it can be frustrating. Um, I think this is the last slide on the writing process. Um, so writing the final draft, um, at this point, you should have had hopefully multiple opportunities for, for input from peers. If these are little bitty short pieces, obviously, they're not gonna go through all these phases of the writing process. We're talking about things that you know, you're know you living with for a longer body of time. And depending on the level of students that you're working with, you might not get to do that until the spring semester uh, with your kiddos. Um, publishing can take many forms. Um, I, would, I would say with younger kids, going back to something you said earlier, maybe you'd have them create advertisements. This would be an opportunity for them to go through the process without having a lot of words be incorporated in it. You could you know, have certain re requirements as to how many, like maybe a slogan and an explanation or something of the campaign. Um, and that could be displayed in the classroom. You can do those electronically now. There are a lot of great infographic websites that you can use free with your kids that make uh, creating advertisements or flyers uh, a little easier. And if you, are, if you have technology in your classroom and you're expected to use it, that would be a good way to pull that in uh, with younger kids. Um, and of course, there's other ideas here, but really publishing is ultimately about showing it with a, sharing it rather with a larger audience. If you have a really big class, which I know Unfortunately, some of you guys might have classes of like 35, 36 kids. Hopefully not too many of you do, but I know that that's a reality now. Um, I frequently could not make time for if they did independent work for everyone to hear all of that. So we would do gallery walks or I would put them in quarters so eight kids would share. Um, that's usually as much as they could stand to listen to anyway of a presentation. Um, and that made it manageable, and it also gave them lots of ideas. And I typically would give them some little form to fill out of an affirmation um, or an ex extension idea, just so that they were building on each other's ideas that way. So just to piggyback on what she said about the publishing mode and presenting in groups and such, keeping in mind that whenever kids are in presentation mode and whether you have whole class or partial, it's so essential that the listeners are doing something. 
somehow assessing or making a note, contributing something rather than just in theory listening. Right. Uh, on average, how many uh, writing projects do you have in, let's say, a semester? In a language class, that's probably going to be pretty a lot more than than English. It depends on the level. Monica, how many do you have in your AP class, IB? Formal ones, we do like a formal, the insight, the persuasive essay, which is a piece of the, we do one a six weeks. Okay, one every, so one every six weeks, so yeah. three a semester. Okay. Sure. Who teaches level three here? How many writing products do you all have your students producing? Uh, that's right, it depends, it varies by length. Do they do any formal yeah, paper at level the three? Big one. We do six big ones, but there's writing. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm, I'm hearing that, that those are your big projects. So what about um, the biggest project you do at level three? How many of those? Yeah? What I do is I combine the small ones into a larger okay. um, yeah. presentation, sure. and they are doing yet another round of rewriting. Okay. Reviews, okay. So this is going to vary a lot. But it's, but be doing something. And it's better if you say, I just can't even do a big, pro I just can't. I don't want them to do a huge essay that I've got a grade. Have them still writing. They can still write. They can still write a lot. You don't necessarily, if you're not required to in your curriculum, it's not like you have to have them write these huge projects. But get them writing often. Yeah, even in English, I would say, I mean, they're writing daily in some small way, you know, all the time. But... Um, I tried to vary the format. So even if they were supposed to be writing something analytical, sometimes it would be through discussion forums across peers um, because that's more exciting for them. After they've already written for me a couple of times, they need to stop writing for me. Well, actually, what happens is that in, sometimes in basic writing course, mm -hmm. you want to go through like uh, explicative and uh, discourse right. and right. argumentative. And it right. Talk, could kind of like work over the different types of... Uh, Modes. Writing, uh, yeah, different modes of writing, like right. like I said, informative, declarative, uh, expository. So that way they have an idea. But of course, this is a, uh, more than very basic, but very basic and related to writing more than language in itself. Right. right. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, um, the writing, especially those larger, longer, lived with pieces, um, will probably be the subject of your assessments. Um, you'll have informal, uh, formative assessments all the time, but those will probably be your more summative moments. Mm -hmm. um, you'll wanna definitely involve peer assessment early in the drafting process, probably after they at least have what I used to call the working draft, um, maybe about 60%. Uh, they can start at least reading it aloud to each other and getting ideas for questions the reader might have um, so that they can address those in content. Again, not grammatical checks or anything like that, just content focused. Um, you also want to have self-assessment along the way. And then you come in at the end, but I really did like to use the exact same rubric that they did. I had them complete it whenever the product was finished and submit it along with uh, their piece. And they always had to write a rationale. So I don't just want to see the score. You have to write a rationale and use language from the rubric to support the assessment uh, score that you've given. Anything to add to that? No, I'm just, while she's talking, I'm thinking back to our novices and how we so want them to write. And you may be saying, well, what kind of products can their final product be? And I was just thinking about how novices could, um, all the different students in the class could create together, compile a clothing catalog with maybe a picture of the clothing. They could get online and go to Corte Inglés or whatever a, a international clothing store and get a few descriptions to build their vocabulary about what the summer dress might look like or the winter pants or whatever. They could do a, make a grocery flyer that you would put up for what sale items are on sale and that sort of thing. I mean, there are all different kinds of formats for those level ones where they are writing, but it's not necessarily an essay or a full-length paragraph or that sort of thing, even full sentences. I think it's nice, too, when you get to this uh, publishing and even, to some extent, the, to, to sort of try to broaden the audience if you can. Um, if you have older students who are a little bit more adept at the language and they are giving presentations, it might be nice to invite a colleague who has an off period who, who shares the language that can also come in and give a little bit of feedback or maybe some parents who want to have a way to be involved would be willing to come in and listen and give some feedback too. It's nice for them to get feedback from 
folks outside of you and the people that they've been getting it from, especially in the spring, um, you know, there's those moments where everybody's kind of like, Whew, I've worked with you a whole lot of times. Um, <laughs> and it'd be nice for them to hear a fresh voice, if nothing else. Uh, I'm thinking fifth, six weeks, it seems like that's usually about when that starts to show up. Okay, so you want to so give our instructions? So what we're going to do is now we're going to put it into your hands. A lot of you, I'm not sure how you're seated in terms of the language that you teach and the level that's your preferred level. But we've got a two extra tables back there. We've got our space up here. And I think maybe I should go and pick tables and tell people. <laughs> Might be the easiest thing to do, right? But I, we want you to get up together. We're going to break up and separate, but hold on. Yeah. Pardon? It's online. Oh, yes, hold on. Before we break into groups, let's talk about what we're going to be doing, okay? First of all, you are going to be breaking into groups. It can be two or three people per group, preferably somebody that teaches your language and your level. Although, oftentimes, it, it, you can just, you personally, if you're the only level one teacher here, you can take the level three idea and break it down, right? So it's not though you're limited. You've each written on the back of your card some themes. You're going to bring these to your groups to talk about them. Number three, we're going to, oh, ha ha, caramba. It's not going to help you anyway. I think that, Sarah, can you come and help them get to the... Yeah, actually, also, I put one of the things on the website, but I, don't, but I can just... No, no, tell us how to get... Just show me how to get there. In fact, I'm going to let you get there. Sarah? Yeah. But we got to show the next slide. Oh, hold on That's just one minute. Hold on. Okay. We're, we're, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go back and show this to you, but we're going to make sure you have the template. Okay. You got... Go ahead. Good, well... You okay. Go for it. So you're essentially creating a short unit, and... Ideally, it will be one that takes that theme, whichever one you guys decide you want to work with as a pair or triad, um, and you're going to make sure that you have the following items within your short unit. This could be a unit that is, you know, two days, three days, four days, however long you think it will take your kids at that level to get through it. You're going to have an engagement activity. Um, you could have more than one, but certainly one that's the identified spark moment. Um, an explorative quick write and opportunity to explain. So making sure that you build in time for them to explain their understanding of the concept that they've just been exploring or discovering. And then you're gonna have elaboration opportunities through at least two active learning activities. I'm just throwing these up because this is what we did today. You do not have to use those. You're certainly welcome to, but you might have another strategy that you would prefer to incorporate, especially if you're working with an existing unit that you're just kind of like, or existing lesson rather, that you're just sort of bumping up a little bit, okay? And at least one analysis task. So something that asks them to work with data in a specific way, okay? And again, if you don't use these, then you can have them analyze in a different way, perhaps with data that you presented to them, especially if you're feeling like they might not be able to, to you know, uh, manipulate the language successfully enough without more of your input, okay? May, and, I, may I clarify that? Just yes. So, for example, you, should, you could share a graph with them that showed uh, major diseases of Latin America, and then they could make, um, they could evaluate and analyze it based on that criteria in the graph itself. Okay, just want to make sure they realize they don't have to create their own data. So evaluation through synthesis and writing. So at the end, we're coming to the assessment, and this is your opportunity to have them put in writing what they learned through this experience. Obviously, it's also their opportunity to evaluate that because they have to think about it to put it down. Any questions just about the expectations of what will be in the mini unit? Okay, we'll post this again momentarily, but let's show you how to get to the template. Yes. Um, the last part, the evaluate the sort of metacognitive piece. Sure. Are, um, the metacognitive piece, which is the last one, evaluation through synthesis, synthesis and writing. Are we assuming that they're doing that in English? I usually do have them do that part in I English. I would like you to do it in their loat. We would like you to have them do something. The synthesis doesn't have to be sophisticated. Mm -mm. The synthesis can be just as you saw, uh, tres personas en la clase toman café. Three people in the classroom drink coffee black. It doesn't have to be sophisticated, but what we want them to do is think through the process and produce something in lote. That's the goal. I'm Writing in lote. <laughs> <laughs> I defer to her on that answer. Yeah, we want, we want you to have them produce the writing in lote. 
And also the, the last thing, the, the synthesis and writing, those were whatever format we want that Any to format. look like. Any format. Anything. It could be very succinct. It could be more complex and longer if you're writing for an upper level. Yes, the synthesis could be something as simple as when I said level one kids could create a catalog of clothing. Mm -hmm. And remember what you guys did earlier was you wrote as a group. That's okay, okay too. Yeah, that's great too. They can do group writing. They can do group writing. Mm -hmm.